And we are live with today's Inton 008 Network Plus Study Group. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Get settled in. In about uh, nine minutes, we will start our live stream. This is our pre-show where I check to see if everything is running as it should. I am recording down here. You can see my Cylons down here running. This is the stream, and everything looks good there. That's also recording because it's recording in the cloud, as they say, uh, or or perhaps they don't, but I say it. And the the stream video, well, laptop's not on. Let's get the laptop on, and boom, there you go. I like that. Boom. Boom, boom, boom. All right, what else we got going on? Hey, chat room. Hello, everyone. Let's plug in our phone because uh, why wouldn't you? What else we got here? I hope everybody's having a great day. I got all new Network Plus questions, so this should be interesting. And uh, I was late doing them. Normally, I do them in the in the weekend. We usually have these live streams on a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. So I usually have a lot of time building up, but this has just been, there's a lot of chaos in my world. So I managed to get them done yesterday. So there you go. Uh, quite a challenge. Quite a challenge. All right. I think we're in pretty good shape, though. We got uh, everything we need for the live stream today. We are up and running for the moment, so that's good. Chat room is here. Hey, chat room. Folks checking in. Remember, you can uh, join us at uh, professormesser.com slash QA. For those of you sort of checking in, let's see if I can move around. Uh, there we go. So you can see what we'll, we will be doing here shortly. Right now, we just have a picture of a, of a map up with the push pins, and you can simply click on where you happen to be, and everybody else can see where you happen to be. You can even zoom up on this a little bit. So we got a lot going on here. Uh, professormaster.com slash QA will get you where you need to be. So we've got this live stream today, and then a week from today, uh, we have another live stream. We have our Security Plus next week. So this should be fun. Folks are checking in already. We've got folks from Cincinnati, Ohio, from the Netherlands. We have South Africa and California and Greece and Indy. Oh, Dr. Jones, we, we got a lot happening here. We got a we got a lot of things going on. Whew, it has been it has been a busy few months, and it's and it continues to be all the way through the holidays. It's gonna be super busy. For me, anyway, we got a lot of content to write, a lot of fun stuff happening, and it's all good. I always like that. So we'll see how this goes. So uh, let's see. Google does not like my stream's current bit rate. What's it complaining about? It says it's lower than the recommendation. Well, I don't know what to tell you, Google. I'm sending you everything you can take. In fact, everything looks great with throughput. I don't even know what it's complaining about. But here we are, nonetheless working through it. We'll we'll figure it out as we go. No worries. So this is um, all Network Plus today. But in the after show, in the second hour, I'll take questions about anything. And you can put your questions in for the after show right now if you want to. There's that extra tab that you can click on in VVox that I can't show you on the screen because I would have to be in VVox to do it. Ah, we might try a different front end here in the new year. I have some ideas of new things we can try. So I might I might be trying that in the new year. Maybe have a single pane of glass. We can just go to one screen and do everything. We'll see if that works out. Okay, we've got presentation looks good. These all look good. Okay, I think we're in good shape. We need to now just wait another five minutes for the top of the hour. Uh, Banana Man chat room your network plus test is tomorrow yeah i guess this is great timing then this could not have worked out better and don't forget we have all of our replays also online so you can always go back through uh years of the network plus replays and uh, maybe pick up a few extra tips and tricks and ideas and thoughts and suggestions it's whatever you're trying to get done before that last 24 hours is coming through uh, the room code, we just go to professormesser.com slash QA. That will take you there. That'll take you there to the, with the room code and everything. You'll be all set. Is it still, in fact, I need to pull up my VVox and see if it's still forwarding people from the VVox app 
to the VBox web page, which sort of defeats the purpose, doesn't it? So my session ID is 120-051-427. Join session. And let's see what it does. The VBox app has moved. Please use our new and improved web app. So this is what they've gone to. It's just a web app, which you effectively get to the same place by going to professormaster.com slash QA. So no more app, I guess. I don't know what they're planning to do with that. So a lot of a lot of challenges there. Hello, Malk and St. Vincent. Thanks for being here again. Good to see you. Thanks for showing up. Uh, that room code. For those of you that did want it, vvox.app, 120-051-427. So I think, uh, well, if it's all in a web app, we can just avoid the, should I even do the first part where we talk about the app? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll change this and hide that because I might want it later, skip it, and then modify this. Boom. And that's what we'll do. See, all edited, edited. I just did it. I edited it. <laughs> buffalo, 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 buffalo. It's one of those things. It's not quite the same thing. It's the whole alliteration thing is what I was going for there. Okay. What else we got going on here? It's as you can tell, for those of you tuning in, it is super cold outside. It's freezing. How do people live like this? It's 54 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't understand, but there we are. Whenever I'm going through and trying to figure out what do I do? What's the next thing? Where am I, where am I going to go with this? Um, and then it gets cold. I got to put on like the long sleeves, get the warm weather clothes or the cold weather clothes so you can stay warm in this weather. Always a challenge. Um, and this part of uh, Florida tends to have some pretty wide swings. So we never know what will be next. But uh, we, are, we are comfy in here. We had the, I had the, uh, you can't see it. I had the, um, let's see if I can get my head out of the way. The fireplace was on earlier. You missed it. It was on. It was running. Just because it's so cold. It's freezing in here. All right, we are a minute and a half away from getting started. How about that? Here's some Florida folks checking in. South Africa's here. Nevada has checked in. Fort Myers, welcome. Thanks for being here. Um, Iran is here. We've got Germany, Colorado, New York checking in. Thanks for being here. It's always fun to do these live streams. Uh, I was going to say to do the live stream live, but it turns out I'm always doing the live stream live. I'm never tuning in to my live stream on the replay. <laughs> I like I like tuning in and watching live streams on the replay. I just can never manage to have that done to mine. So that's, that's the challenge. Uh, if I can get that to work, if I can find a way to have my live stream so that I could watch it when it's done, that would be great. That'd be fantastic. Ah, hello, Greensboro and North Carolina and both North Carolinas. Um, we got Seattle. Nigeria is here. What's up, CO? Which could be many things, but I'm guessing Colorado. Uh, Vegas has checked in. Got, uh, got a lot of folks here. Thanks for being here. Well, we're just about ready to get started. We've got about 15 seconds. Let's see if I can get my keynote up and running. Is keynote going to be up and running? Come on now. Come on, Keynote. You can do it. There you go. Had to reset it and get it going. That was a little that was a little touch and go there for a bit. But it allowed me to kill a little bit of time here so we can start our live stream. Why don't we do that, everybody? Let's get this thing going. Here we go, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the December 2023 Professor Messer in 10 Network Plus Study Group. We've got an entire hour of Q&A that I have written 
all brand new that comes directly from the Network Plus exam objectives. And we're going to see how well you know some of these different topics. And we'll dive into the details of every question. And then, of course, in the second hour, I open up the phone line, or not the phone line, but the chat line, and you're able to uh, join us there and ask any question you'd like. In fact, if you are here live right now, there is a tab at the top of your screen. You can find that tab on our VVox app. And you can find that at uh, professormesser.com slash QA. Simply pop open a new browser window or open a browser on your mobile device and visit the URL professormesser.com slash QA. And if you do that, there will be a tab at the top of the screen. You can flip over and submit any question you would like. Now, that will submit it and put it in the queue. I will still see them on this side, even though you won't see the question you asked on your side or you won't see other people's questions, I guess I should say. Um, and that's a great place to go. Also, if you'd like to answer questions today, is that same link, professormesser.com slash QA. So it would be great to try this out. Let's see if we can pull up a question. Let's try one from last week, or last month, rather, because there was a question asked and I'd like to see how well we do on this one. And if you go to that link, professormesser.com slash QA, there will be a question waiting for you. That question asks, a package of network transceivers has been delivered to a secure storage facility. Which of the following would best describe this delivery location? Is that an access control vestibule, a smart locker, an immediate distribution frame, cloud storage, or locked data center cabinet? So when you start working through these challenges with this particular uh, this particular question and answer, uh, please keep in mind that we don't want to answer in the chat room. We also don't want to answer when you're going to uh, when you're working through um, maybe hints. Don't put any hints in the chat room either. Instead, you want to go to professormesser.com/qa, and that will take you right into the VVox front end. You won't need an ID or anything because that's already embedded into that particular link. Although you can see on the screen, if you are somewhere where it does ask you for an ID, the ID today is 120-051-427. Now we're going to come back to this question in just a bit to see how you do with this one. Now, of course, we have one of these live streams that we do every month. And you can, of course, uh, tune in to see everything that we're doing. We also have all of these live streams, all of our training videos, and everything that we create with our video training courses is available on YouTube to watch for free. If you would like to join our channel, it would be great if you could subscribe. Simply visit professormesser.com slash YouTube, and that will take you right to our YouTube channel. You can click that subscription button that's right there. We also have a weekly pop quiz question for Network Plus that I send out on the service formerly known as Twitter and the service currently known as Instagram. You can find those at professormesser.com slash Twitter or slash Instagram. Either one of those works. In fact, if you want to find me anywhere, just type in professormesser.com slash LinkedIn slash Facebook slash whatever you're trying to do. And I try to put a few of those up. And if I'm not at a, in a certain social media site you would like me to be, please let me know. And we'll add another one. There's always room for another one, isn't there? Uh, let's also talk about the Network Plus certification itself. The current version of the Network Plus cert that you go and you, you take, that exam version, is called the N10008. You've probably seen that pasted everywhere. Because that signifies what version of your training materials you happen to be using. So you want to be sure that you look at your training materials and that they all say the N10008 because that is the current version. It is the version that was released on September the 15th of 2021, and we estimate that it will probably retire somewhere around March of 2025. There are also, uh, of course, a limit as to how much time you get to take this exam. It's a 90-minute limit, and you could get a maximum of 90 questions on this exam. You could get fewer than 90 questions. You need to get a score of 720 on a scale from 100 to 900. It's an odd grading system, but there it is. Uh, ultimately, we don't know how they grade their exams. So 
the, the idea of reverse engineering would not be possible here. So just do the best you can on the exam. The grade will work itself out at the end anyway. You will, uh, on the exam, see that there are a number of multiple choice questions, but there are also performance-based questions. And we'll talk about performance-based questions later on on the live stream today. Now, of course, all of our training videos are available for you to watch for free on YouTube. There's no registration. There's no videos that I've hidden somewhere behind a paywall. Everything is out on YouTube for you to watch. And you can, of course, find all of those and watch them at any time on YouTube. Not everybody has access to high-speed internet. Not everybody has access to YouTube all the time. So I do have a version of the course that you can purchase and download so that you don't need to be connected to the internet. That not only includes audio, but also video of the course, my exam uh, hacks ebook, my network plus course notes and other things are also included in there. You can learn more about that on my website, professormesser.com slash net success. This live stream is available for you to watch immediately afterwards. I hit the stop button and it takes a couple of minutes to be posted automatically to YouTube, which makes it very easy. I also create an audio-only podcast version of this. And if you have a podcast listening program and you would like to have my live streams automatically downloaded onto your mobile device or other podcast listening device, you simply go to professormesser.com slash podcast, and you can have my A Plus Network Plus or Security Plus podcasts all enabled and installed on your device. We also... Uh, since we're talking about podcasts and being able to do replays, we also have video replays of this as well over on YouTube. And you'll notice about a day later that suddenly a bunch of timestamps show up on the YouTube video description. Those don't happen automatically as much as our world of this uh, would like to automate everything. There are certain things that are very, very difficult to automate. This happens to be one of them, but it's okay. Because my marketing manager, Lori, who's watching this replay, hi, Lori, she's going through and putting in the timestamps for you. So you can't go wrong. You will always find what you need. And it's a quick way to jump around the video and look for exactly the information you might need. And you can go back years to be able to see those. They're all in the YouTube video description. We also have our 24 by 7 365 chat. This is our Discord server. You can find me and many other people who are studying for their A plus, Network plus, and Security plus on our Discord. Simply visit professormesser.com slash Discord or simply follow the link that is at the top of my website. You'll find the Discord server very, very easy to be able to find all of those. So this is a, a good way to keep track of things that are going on here when we're not live. And I'm usually hanging out in the discords. It's a great place to come in, say hi, and learn from other people that are going through exactly the same exams that you are. Eventually, you will need to take your exam, and you'll have to pay to take your exam. That's the way it works. Of course, you could go to the CompTIA website and pay full price, but why would you do that when I have discounted vouchers already available on my website? You can find those at professormesser.com slash vouchers. And that's available not just to download for the voucher, but I also give you a little bit extra. I've taken a list of tips and tricks that I have accumulated through the years for studying for certification exams and some tricks that can also help you if you're working through the exam itself. That's all in my exam hacks ebook. You get that free when you purchase a voucher from professormesser.com. So not only are you paying less, you're getting more. And that's the idea that we like to, to follow here on the Professor Messer website. So let's talk about that question we asked earlier, which is a package of network transceivers has been delivered to a secure storage facility. Which of the following would best describe this delivery location? Is that access control vestibule, smart locker, intermediate distribution frame, cloud storage, or locked data center cabinet? Let's see how you did with this question. We did much better this month than we did last month. 53% of you say the answer is smart locker. 25% say a locked data center cabinet. 10% say an access control vestibule. We've got 7% that said an intermediate distribution frame. And then 2% say a locked storage. So this is, this is a pretty good question because you may find yourself trying to find the best way to connect in and use all of these. Let's see if I can plug in my power here. 
or I'm going to lose power on this system. There we go. Um, one of the things that I always work through when I'm looking at these questions is figuring out what it what it couldn't be, what it may not what may not be the correct answer. And this is a pretty good one to think that through. Uh, for example, we know that we're getting a package and it needs to be delivered to a secure facility. Well, if we start at the top, an access control vestibule is not going to be able to provide you with uh, a, a secure way to store this delivery. Access control vestibules effectively um, a, a, a entry level area where you can control the flow of people through an area. So this is one where it's great for controlling people, but it's not for storing anything that may be delivered and certainly not securely. So that's not what I would choose. Intermediate distribution frames are effectively the wiring closet that we might have on a floor of a building. That's not a place where you would have anything delivered. Cloud storage I hope we don't deliver things to our cloud storage. Who knows where it's going? And then a locked data center cabinet. Well, we can't expect anybody to deliver something to a locked cabinet that's in our data center. In fact, if somebody was able to do that, we would have a significant security problem. So it's not going to be that answer either. The smart locker is the answer that we were looking for. Smart lockers, of course, are used all the time. You may even use these if you have a, an Amazon delivery, for example. There's Amazon smart lockers everywhere, it seems. And you can have your delivery go to the smart locker where you can securely log in to the smart locker to release that delivery and pick it up. That way, you don't have to be waiting at home. You don't have to hope that they can find the address. You just have them drop it at the smart locker. It's a great way to know that your order is going to be delivered, and you can just pick it up anytime that you would like. Smart lockers are a great way to do that. And in fact, that is the right answer here. About 54% or so of you chose smart locker as the answer, and you would be absolutely correct. Well done. So that was our rewind question for the month. Now let's do some new questions that you've never seen before. And we're going to start with a question that is not a multiple choice question. And one of the things I mentioned earlier is that the exam consists of multiple choice questions and performance-based questions. The very beginning of your exam, you will get a handful of performance-based questions. Those performance-based questions are simply a format that is not multiple choice. So it might be fill in the blank. It might be matching. It might be drag and drop. There might be uh, putting things in a particular order. There's a lot of things you, you can do to change the way you ask these questions. So I have for you a performance-based question. This is more of a visual performance-based question, but it's sort of a matching one as well. So it's not a fill in the blank. So that might help you a little bit. Here is your performance-based question of the month. This is not going to be great for you folks who are on the podcast because it is a visual question where I have four pictures, four images that are on the screen, and I'm asking you to match the name to the picture. And you can see that I have those four interfaces, those four cables or whatever they happen to be. You'll have to decide. And then on the right side of the screen, I have a lot of different connector names. And I want you to tell me what name goes with what connector. The different connector names are... SFP, ST, RJ45, DB9, F connector, BNC, LC, or RJ11. It's quite a few. It's quite a few to, to step through, isn't it? So let's see how well you know visually what these interfaces should look like. That's a pretty reasonable uh, question, especially for an exam like Network Plus, where Network Plus can, can really cover a lot of different topics. And of course, all of those that are listed on that list of connectors are all from the Network Plus exam objectives. So that gives you an idea. If you're looking at that list and you're thinking, hmm, I don't recognize that particular one, you should make a note because you'll want to go back to your study materials and see if you can jog your memory over what that particular image or what that particular name might be. And then, of course, you would want to know what that looks like on the image as well. So you got a couple of things you can do there. Match the name to the picture. Number of you are, the, are putting it in. It's effectively a fill in the blank. If you just want to submit it as 1A, 2B, 3C, 4D, that's all you need to do. Now, obviously, that's not the right answer. That would be bad. 
if I, if I did that one. It's a little more randomized than that. It's a little more difficult than that. We'll see how you do. A number of you are getting those answers in now. So I'm going to give the rest of you a chance to look through these, figure out what you think it might be, and then lock in your answer. Submit that question and see what it happens to be in there. Having that visual feedback of what these interfaces and connectors and cables look like is an important one because you might be in the data center, you're behind an enormous rack of equipment. There is tons of systems that are all plugged into many different connectors. And it's helpful if you can look at a connector that's on the back of a device and go, oh, that's this particular kind of connection. Uh, all of that is there. If you want to submit your answer, simply visit professormesser.com slash QA. So pop open a new browser window and go to professormesser.com slash QA to submit that question. See if you happen to know what the answers are. A number of you are doing pretty well with this one. I'm, I'm thinking you're, you're probably pretty familiar with this particular question. I'm watching some of these come through and people saying, what was that one? Is that, is that this? Is that the other one? So I like that some of you are, are really putting this through. A lot of you are doing very well. There's one answer in here that for these four that are listed, one that consistently seems to be not quite what one would expect. So this is this is a really good question to be able to see these. Um, folks in the chat room saying, this is old tech. This, this technology is old. This technology is running in every data center in the world. <laughs> Got to tell you, there's nothing old about anything on the screen. We have those technologies running right now on the biggest networks in the world. And they're running like a champ because we're using all of these. That's one of the beauties about networking is that we are constantly using these different technologies and how they operate. Uh, all of these are new installations. Every single one of these connectors can be used today for modern technologies. Not old technologies, not legacy technologies, not played out technologies. Every single one of these connectors is running right now on some of the latest technologies that we are using. So that's, that's, uh, that's and I think that's kind of a misnomer. I think people sometimes think that these exams are contain content that is relatively old. These are updated every three years or so. So the and networking is around for for an extended period of time. You know, working through these. Let's see how you did with this one. Let's step through all four of these images and see if we happen to know what these are. We'll start in our upper left and be able to see what these are whenever we start working through these. As as I'll remind the chat room, please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. Uh, the very first one on our list is this odd connector that kind of has a, uh, a connection going into it, and then you turn it to tighten it. Uh, this is a bayonet-style connector named after, quite literally, a bayonet, um, being able to plug in and, uh, and work through what, uh, and tighten it down. Uh, makes it very nice because you can't pull it off of a system unless you turn it a quarter way, and then finally it will slip out. So that is a BNC. Uh, the, the bayonet connector is a very common one to see on those types of connectors. And, and the BNC connector is one that we see even used today uh, and work through. This, this is a very common and popular connector to use for video, for audio. In fact, I'm running 4K video in my studio right now with cables that are connected with BNC. So that's that's the way those are are focused. Yes, the chat room has even said, hey, I thought those were called British naval connectors. They are ni neither British nor are they naval. Uh, but I think you'll probably, if you went to the British Navy, they're probably using these connectors, but they didn't invent them. They're not their connectors. Uh, it's a bayonet, Neil Councilman, connector for sure. Uh, the next on our list, the second one over across the top with the blue background is... A fiber connector. This fiber connector type is an ST connector. This is a connection that is, interestingly enough, very commonly, and I specifically made it so you couldn't see the bayonet part on the ST connector, but ST connectors also use a bayonet style connection where you, pl you plug it in and twist it a quarter of a way and it locks it in place. There are other style ST connectors as well, but that is the most common style. Um, and the one that you probably will see primarily uh, as that type. The ST is the one that uh, you'll use for a fiber connection. You can probably tell it's fiber.
because of the protective cover that is around the fiber on the outside. So you've got uh, that fiber connection in this case is an ST connector. There are a number of fiber connections you need to know on the exam. That's only one of them. Uh, next on our list, uh, bottom left, is this what appears to be a coax connection. And in this particular case, this connector type is called, uh, perhaps non-interestingly, the F connector. Now, what does the F stand for? doesn't stand for anything. It stands for a, a letter of the, of the alphabet. Uh, there was, in fact, an A connector, a B connector, a C connector, a D connector. And they finally got to the F connector. There's also a G connector and an H connector, and it keeps going. Uh, one of the things that you will find is sometimes there's just not a lot of thought put into the connection type. And when, we, when the company that created this connector created all of these different types, they didn't know that it would be chosen as the standard for everything that we do with these coax connections on our cable television systems, among other things. So F was simply the letter they chose. And in this case, that is indeed an F connector, very commonly associated with cable modems, uh, audio, video, and voice all running over that same broadband connection. And lastly on our list is what appears to be a modular connector. But what type of modular connector is it? In this case, we would have to count that there are six different positions and two different connectors on here. That means that this is wired as an RJ11. RJ11 connection is what that is. Again, a popular, most, one of the most popular types of networks, uh, internet connections these days is DSL. And DSL connects with RJ11 cables. Another good example of how all four of these technologies, as I mentioned, are used today with new installations. Um, and amazingly, this technology has been, um, this, we've created it so long ago, tens and tens of years ago, decades ago, and yet we're still able to use that technology on some of today's most modern networks quite remarkable. And those are the four options that we were looking for. We've got the first connection is a BNC connector. The second is an ST connector. Third is an F connector. And then lastly, we have the RJ11 connector. Now, as I mentioned, you should also go through this list and see if you can, at least in your mind's eye, visualize what these different connectors are. You should know what an SFP is, what an RJ45 looks like, what a DB9 looks like, uh, what an LC connector happens to be. So all of these re real connections. So absolutely go through and have a familiarity with those other connectors. And there's more on the exam objectives. Make sure you check the exam objectives because you never know what the different options might be that you could be faced with during the exam. Let's do uh, another question. We're going to shift gears into a multiple choice question. This next one on our list asks, a network administrator is configuring port security. Which of the following would describe this configuration? Would that be connect to two sites over an encrypted tunnel? Allow all traffic to a specific port number. Limit the number of MAC addresses on an interface. Bond multiple interfaces into a single link. Or block all known attacks through an interface. So there's our question. As always, of course, please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. That question again asks, a network administrator is configuring port security. Which of the following would describe this configuration? Is it? Connect two sites over an encrypted tunnel. Allow all traffic to a specific port number. Limit the number of MAC addresses on an interface. Bond multiple interfaces into a single link. Or block all known attacks through an interface. Do you think you know the answer? You can lock it in by visiting professormesser.com slash QA to lock in your answer. I see a number of you have already plugged your answer in as to what you think the answer might be. Now we're going to find out if we really do know what the answer might be. Security and network administration and configurations, these are all topics that you could run into on the exam. So you have to be familiar with all of these different types of configurations. Let's see how you did with this one. Uh, we're going to stop our poll and see how the answers turned out. 
We've got 51% of you that say the answer is limit the number of MAC addresses on an interface. But a very strong 22% of you say this would allow all traffic to a specific port number. 16% say this would block all known attacks through an interface. And 8% say it would connect two sites over an encrypted tunnel. And only 0.88%, barely, barely almost, a, almost a percentage, say bond multiple interfaces into a single link. Well, in this case, we're talking about port security. That was the topic that we're covering. Port security allows you to specify for a single interface on a switch how many devices can communicate through that single interface. So you can think of uh, someone comes into their desk on a Monday morning, they log in, um, and then they go to lunch. While they're at lunch, someone comes up to their computer, unplugs their Ethernet connection, and plugs in their own laptop. Now, how do you prevent somebody from gaining access to the network that way? Somebody's gained access to the, the physical plant. They, they have access to the cabling. How can we stop someone from taking advantage of that? And the way that you stop them is by configuring port security. The switch itself is going to monitor throughout the day how many MAC addresses have I seen on this interface. And if we have set port security to only allow a single MAC address, that MAC address is now locked into the switch. And no matter what happens, if somebody else unplugs that device and plugs in their own device, it's not going to work because that, that switch will not limit anything coming through. Now, that term port security is a it's a bit of a proprietary term. It's very Cisco-ish in its name. Not all switches call it port security, but most enterprise switches have a feature like this that can limit access based on a MAC address. So it's a it's a very common interface or common security uh, feature to have. Um, and it's one of many things you can do to help uh, prevent uh, someone from gaining access to the network. It's not the only thing. There are ways to work around any security issue. So if somebody, for example, knew the MAC address of a system, they could change their own MAC address, and that would at least get them through the first part. But of course, your network is probably configured with 802.1x, so then they would have to have login credentials. So there's always a barrier that we put in place. We never rely on a single type of security. We want defense in depth. That's what we call it in the industry that talks about a layered approach to security that doesn't rely on one, two, three, or even four different security features. We're relying on as many different security features as we can, can manage on these particular networks. So this is a, a good one to use, and it's one that would block someone from gaining access to a network. So if you're one of the 51% of you that said limit the number of MAC addresses on an interface, Yes, you would be correct. That would be the right answer. But let's look at these other answers as well. We had 22% that said, allow all traffic to a specific port number. In most cases, a, a switch and generally a router or firewall can be used to filter or limit access based on a port number. But the port security, and the term port security in this case, is not referring to a TCP or UDP port. It's referring to a physical port, or I guess in the case of a switch, it could also be a logical or virtual port as well. But it's referring to the interface we use to connect a physical or virtual device into the switch itself. So it's not talking about a layer 4 UDP or TCP port number. So in this case, it would not be talking about allowing traffic to a specific port number. We've got connecting two sites over an encrypted tunnel. That's commonly done with a VPN, IPsec. SSL, many different VPN types. Uh, that is not one that you would commonly have associated with port security. A term security has many different connotations, doesn't it? An encrypted tunnel certainly implies a secure connection, but has nothing to do with port security. We have blocking all known attacks through an interface. These are commonly done through some type of intrusion prevention system, commonly built into today's next generation firewalls. But blocking known attacks through an interface is not associated with port security. And lastly, bonding multiple interfaces onto a single link. That's a link aggregation, a lag, as we say, in the industry. In this case, bonding interfaces is also not associated with port security. Port security itself 
is a term associated with switches. So folks in the chat room were saying, but you didn't tell us this was switches. That's right. Because you should see the term port security and instantly know, oh, that's a function that you will find in a switch. Port security is not something you would find in a router. That's not where we do port security. It's not where we, we don't assign or limit access based on a MAC address in a router because a router only sees the local MAC addresses. Router isn't po can't do that. It's not possible for a router to provide this port security functionality for everybody in the organization. The only way you could do it is if you go to the switch itself where everyone is directly connected, where you can see everyone's MAC address. So great question, though. It makes you think, though, well, just do it in the router. Nope, can't do it in the router. That would be great, but you can't. It only is in a switch. So anytime you see port security, you should automatically be thinking, oh, it's a switch. It's already a switch configuration. So that might help as well for you to remember that for the exam. Let's do another question. We got more here. Next on our list is this question that asks, a company is purchasing a pair of redundant firewalls. Which of the following firewall specifications would indicate the expected uptime of the firewalls? Would that be MTTR, RTO, EULA, MTBF, or RPO? A company is purchasing a pair of redundant firewalls, which the following firewall specifications would indicate the expected uptime of the firewalls. Would that be MTTR, RTO, EULA, MTBF, or RPO? I have to find out what, what this one might be. If you think you know the answer, follow the link on your screen. Go to professormesser.com slash QA to lock in your answer. Please, no answers in the chat room. Please, no hints in the chat room. You've been very good with that today. But I just keep saying it over and over anyway because I'm programmed at this point to do so. Uh, just you can, you can hopefully tolerate me just a little bit. But you guys are doing great with that one. All of these abbreviations are real. All of these abbreviations come to you from the Network Plus exam objectives. If you don't recognize one of these abbreviations, you should write that down because you need to know it. Because although a question I'm asking you here may be associated with one of those abbreviations, you might get a question on your exam that talks about one of the other abbreviations. So I'm I'm not writing or not somehow have access to exam questions. That would not be ethical and it wouldn't help you very much. Instead, all of these questions I write every time we do one of these. So they're, they're new every single time. Um, you'll get a different flavor of a question, a different set of answers. They'll be in a different order because I build all of these every month so that we have something different that we can look at that we've never seen before that we would not be compelled to think that it may go one direction or another. Uh, let's see how you did with this one. The question asks, a company is purchasing a pair of redundant firewalls. Which of the following firewall specifications would indicate the expected uptime of the firewalls? Would that be MTTR, RTO, EULA, MTBF, or RPO? And if we have a look at your answers, 47% of you say it's MTBF. We have 27% that say it is MTTR. We have 14% that say it's RTO, 7% say EULA, and then finally 3% for RPO. So we're all over the place on this one. So let's look at some of these abbreviations and see if we can get a better grasp on what these might be. Let's first talk about a recovery time objective. Uh, what is our time objective? And what is the what is the time where we could say, yes, we are finally hit our objective, we, are, we got back up and running in this time frame. And we got back up and running because we hit a particular service level. Um, and the RTO, or recovery time objective, gives us the idea of what objective is it that we need to work towards to get back up and running. Um, it's a, a very important consideration because what is up and running? And what if you only have half the data? Is that still up and running? Well, we'll have to figure out because our recovery point objective will tell us uh, whether we hit that or not. So we have the time frame that it takes to get up and running. And then how do we know that we're up and running? Those two work in hand in hand, the RTO and the RPO, to be able to provide you with that. Now, if you've got a device that has failed, uh, then you'll need to fix that device. And the MTTR, the mean time to repair, can give you an idea of how long it may take to repair that particular problem. So if you lose a device, a switch fails, a router fails, a, a firewall fails, and someone says, how long is it going to be before we're back up and running? Well, the MTTR is 
two hours, four hours, six hours, or whatever it happens to be. Um, but sometimes you're wanting to have a knowledge of how uh, how well a product might run or how consistently a product might operate before you would expect that device to fail. This is a very common statistic that people will measure before they purchase a new product so they can expect a downtime after a certain amount of time goes by. Well, how much time is that? Well, it depends on the inner workings of these devices. For example, if it's a firewall and the firewall doesn't have any moving parts inside of it, maybe it's a very small firewall. It uses a heat sink uh, to be able to just get rid of the heat, get, uh, move all of that out. It doesn't have a fan, so there's no moving parts of a fan. It's all solid state, as we like to say. There's no moving parts inside of that. Then you would have a higher mean time between failures than a device that perhaps has many fans inside of it or spinning hard drives inside of it. You know, those are devices that are mechanical and they tend to fail faster. And so if you look and compare one device that has hard drives and fans and another device that has no hard drives and no fans, you'll probably have a much longer mean time between failures for the solid state device. And that's the important statistic when you're about to make a purchase Am I getting a device that's going to run and run and run without failing? And uh, it's, a, it's a good consideration if you're purchasing those. So a mean time between failures would certainly be the value we were hoping to see here because we wanted to know what the expected uptime of those firewalls might be. How long is it going to stay up and running until it finally fails? That is our mean time between failures, and about 47% of you chose that one. Uh, we talked about the mean time to repair. 27% of you chose that option. That's how long it takes to actually fix it, and not what we were hoping to find. RTO and RPO we discussed as our recovery time objective, our recovery point objective. And then we didn't talk about EULA. EULA is the end user license agreement. It was very well described in the chat room earlier as the thing you always scroll past and not read and click accept very quickly. How fast can we do that? So if you're installing a game, that's the first mini game. That's your first side quest. How fast can you scroll down and hit accept? Probably not the best way to approach an end user license agreement, though. And in fact, if you are part of a corporate or very large organization and you're making a purchase of software, you usually are buying more than one license of software. I've worked with organizations that are buying hundreds or thousands of licenses at the same time. And they will read through every word of the end user license agreement before they purchase. And they will tell you, well, we looked through your end user license agreement. We don't like this thing right here. We would like to change this and we'd like to remove that one. And all the lawyers get involved and they talk to each other about how they can change the end user license agreement. That sounds fine with us. We'll remove that. We'll change this other piece of it. And then we'll, we'll send the end user license agreement. Everybody agrees to it. And now the company can purchase the software. Um, a very common process. So although we at home tend to race through our end user license agreement and not even read through it, uh, when you start getting into very large organizations or even not very large organizations, you find that people pay a lot of attention to the end user license agreement because it is a legally binding contract between you and that software company. And uh, it has some significant legal ramifications as well, something you should not take lightly. The, the right answer here, mean time between failures, if you answered that, the 47% of you that answered that got that one absolutely correct. Well done. Um, that is exactly what we were looking for. Now, as you can probably tell already, there is a lot of information in this exam. The Intent 008 Network Plus exam, if you look at my entire course, it is 93 videos and over 14 hours of content. Um, it is a, a very big exam full of acronyms and full of pictures of interfaces that you've never seen before. Well, that's why we should spend time really looking at it to see what we need to know out of these exam objectives and the things that are important. So what I did was take all 93 videos, the entire 14 hours of content, and I collapsed it into one document. This is my Intent 008 course notes. There's both a digital version. You can see the digital version. I didn't even pull out 
the physical version. There's also a physical version of this that you can get. The digital version, though, is identical to what you would see in the physical version. And as you can see, has all of the text, all of the graphics, all of the charts, all of the diagrams that I've created. They are all in here, separated out video by video. So this makes a perfect guide to go hand in hand as you're watching the videos because you can follow along with everything that we're going through. And it's all in here. All of your interface types, all of the connectors, that's where you'll find them is in the course notes. It is not only a great way to have all of this information consolidated that you can take with you on any of your mobile devices, or if you want to get the physical book, you'll also get the digital version for free. You'll have that also to take along with you. And it's a great way to study, something that can summarize everything that you've gone through when you've been watching these videos. You can learn more about my course notes. Simply visit my website, visit professormesser.com slash NPCN for Network Plus course notes, or simply use the pull-down menu at the top of the screen and choose Network Plus and the Network Plus course notes. Let's see if we can do another multiple choice question on our list. This one is a question that asks, an attacker is modifying network traffic in real time between a client and a web server. Which of the following would best describe this attack? Would it be on path, piggybacking, brute force, DDoS, or VLAN hopping? It's got to be one of these, right? An attacker is modifying network traffic in real time between a client and a web server. Which of the following would best describe this attack? Is it on path, piggybacking, brute force, DDoS, or VLAN hopping? If you think you know the answer, follow the links on your screen to go to professormesser.com slash QA to lock in. Lock it in, your answer, and figure out what it happens to be. As always, please, no answers in the chat room. Please, no hints in the chat room. We're going to pretend that we are sitting here on our exam. We don't have a Google. We don't have people we can talk to. We can't phone a friend. Uh, we have to instead see if we can figure this out ourselves. Maybe you know what the answer is. Uh, see if you can lock down what these are. You should be able to figure out maybe what it isn't, and maybe that will narrow down your choices. Always a good idea when you're working with a multiple choice. There might be some multiple choice questions on your exam that will ask you for multiple answers. Sometimes that happens, but they tell you how many. So they might give you a list of six answers, and they'll tell you pick two, and you have to pick two of those. So it's not as bad as you might think it, it is. I've seen some practice exams where they just don't even tell you how many to choose. It's up to you, which is just uh, baffling. Not sure why why that's helpful, but but they but the exams fortunately much nicer to us about that. So I have to say, let's see how you did with this one. The question again asks: An attacker is modifying network traffic in real time between a client and a web server. Which of the following would best describe this attack? Is it on path, piggybacking, brute force, DDoS? or VLAN hopping. And we can see that 78% of you say the answer is on path. We have 10% that say the answer is a DDoS. And then 5% say piggybacking, 5% say VLAN hopping, and 2% say brute force or so. I'm, I'm, both, I'm both rounding up and down at the same time on the same screen. Not very accurate, but you get the idea. 78% of you say it's on path which is certainly leading me down that road of thinking, well, maybe it is on path. Uh, if you are someone who's been around security for a while, you've probably in, uh, historically heard the term man in the middle, person in the middle, uh, being in the middle. They tried to change up that in the middle thing uh, so, that, so that it wasn't uh, the man keeping everybody down. It was something that's more generic, something that we can all use as a term to recognize this. And that's why you'll see that uh, all of the, the latest versions of courseware use the term on path to describe this type of attack, which ironically is probably a little bit more descriptive than what we're actually doing here. We are on path. We have to be in the middle of this connection and on path to be able to uh, both intercept the information coming in, look at it, and then we could just send it on its way but we could also modify it if we're sitting in the middle of the connection. Obviously, this is implying in many ways this is not something that is um, not something that is encrypted. It would have to be in the clear for us to be able to do this. 
Uh, but it is a very, very common way to intercept and modify information. In fact, a, a good example of an on-path attack is one that is art poisoning. That's a very common on-path attack um, that we can use to be able to sit in the middle of a connection and be able to work through it. So if you are someone who has um, been in the industry for a while and you've heard the term man in the middle, then you're probably now also familiar with the newer version of that term, an on-path attack. Exactly what you would work through to be able to know what this one is. And in fact, most of you did know what this one was because 78% of you say on path is the right answer. That's the one you should have chosen. DDoS is a way that you can uh, use in many cases, many multiples of individuals that are all attacking one system at one time from many different locations. It is a denial of service attack that is distributed across many locations Therefore, we call it a distributed denial of service attack. Granted, not very creative, but that's what it is. A DDoS is the abbreviation of that distributed denial of service attack. And a DDoS does not modify network traffic in real time between two devices. It simply prevents a service from operating. Uh, piggybacking, 4% uh, of you chose that one. That describes a way to uh, get access into a building without having any access credentials. Uh, for piggybacking, the person bringing you into the building with no, they have credentials, you don't, but they're allowing you in without those credentials. And that is not something you should be doing on a corporate network, at least not one where you're concerned at all about security. VLAN hopping, also 4%. VLAN hopping is a way to get data sent to a different VLAN than the one that you are on, which should not happen. That's not something that should should ever happen. And I have a diagram and an animation in my VLAN hopping video that describes two different ways that attackers could try to hop between VLANs. Not a great way to communicate across VLANs. Very, there's significant limitations, but it can be done uh, in certain configurations. Hopefully, your network has been configured not to allow VLAN hopping. And then brute force describes most commonly a way to identify someone's password by trying every possible iteration of letters, numbers, and special characters. Uh, obviously, this can be a very time-consuming process, but brute force is a very common way to be able to see if we can gain access to someone's system by trying uh, past different types of combinations to see if we can finally break our way in, effectively brute forcing our way in the door. Uh, interestingly enough, brute force is also, and if you ever get to the security plus, brute force is not only a digital password uh, password checking type of attack, uh, it does discuss physical brute force as well, which is someone taking their self and pushing themselves through a window or through a door. There's a physical brute force. There is, there is certainly a, a part of security associated with that. But in our particular case, we're really talking about password, neither one of those really applies here because modifying network traffic in real time, whether it's trying to uh, backwards engineer a password or trying to break through a door, neither one of those things would apply. The only thing here that does apply is the very first option for on path. And 78% of you got that one absolutely correct. Let's do another question. I've got one here that I think maybe you, maybe you know this one. Uh, or maybe you don't. We're going to find out. Uh, here is the question that asks, when starting their computer, a user in accounting receives a DHCP address associated with the marketing department. Which of the following would be the most likely cause of this issue? Would it be default route, duplex configuration, VLAN assignment, certificate issue, or switching loop. Got a few options here. When starting their computer, a user in accounting receives a DHCP address associated with the marketing department. Which of the following would be the most likely cause of this issue? Would it be default route, duplex configuration, VLAN assignment, certificate issue, or switching loop? If you think you know the answer, follow the links on your screen. Go to professormesser.com slash QA and lock in your answer. Please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints 
in the chat room. That's uh, We need that on a mug or something at some point, don't we? We probably do. We will figure it out eventually where, where we would want to put this. Uh, we're doing very well today, though. I'm hoping we get this one. I feel like the last question, uh, a lot of us did so well on that one. I'm, I'm feeling good vibes on this one, too. So we're going to see how we did with this particular question. Um, you might run into this, in fact, once you get up to a point where you're a network administrator, you're configuring switches, you're installing routers, you're setting up the configs between all of these different devices, and someone might call you. You might get a ticket that says every time the person in accounting turns on their computer, their IP address is for the marketing department, what's going on? And uh, that's up to you to decide whether you're going to solve your problem by going down this list of different options. Not as many people answering this one quite as fast, but we're going to stop our polling right there to see how we did. Is the answer default route, duplex configuration, VLAN assignment, certificate issue, or switching loop? And 70% of you says VLAN assignment. Uh, that is the case, 70% VLAN assignment. Uh, we got 7% that say duplex configuration, 9% said default route, 6% said certificate issue, and 5% say switching loop. So single digits, well, maybe default route comes out to almost 10%, but by far 70% say it's VLAN assignment. But would that really cause the problem that we're seeing with different subnet addresses appearing on our particular network? Well, if you're familiar at all with setting up a VLAN inside of a switch, then you would know, yes, this could absolutely cause the problem that we have seen here because we are assigning a specific virtual LAN to a specific interface on that particular switch. For example, you can see that this switch has, these are the first 10 ports of this gigabit Ethernet switch, uh, GE1 through GE10. Some of them are set up to be access interfaces. Some of them are set up to be trunk interfaces. The access interfaces are the ones that we as humans use to plug in our devices to access the network. The trunk interfaces are connections that are moving between two different switches. So those access interfaces, you'll notice, have different VLAN IDs associated with them. Uh, some VLAN IDs, some of these interfaces are on VLAN 254. Some of them are on VLAN 100. Um, and so you might switch those up. Maybe somebody misconfigures that VLAN number inside the switch, or maybe somebody plugs them into the wrong interface on the switch. Both of those would cause someone to be on the wrong VLAN. And when they get an IP address, they may see the IP address is one that is not from the right connection because you've either configured the switch wrong or you've plugged into the wrong interface on that switch. This is a very good example of how VLANs can be misassigned to cause a problem with this configuration. Now, some people in the chat room said, your user's not going to know they're on the the wrong IP address. That's absolutely correct. They're not. But you're in the network team. You don't take phone calls from users. You get tickets from the help desk. The help desk has already done the first part of the hard work and figured out, oh, you're getting the wrong IP address. Let me send this over to the network team to resolve. So that's a, a very good point and a, an important consideration when you're working through problems like this. Default routes would cause an issue with where traffic was going outside of your subnet. So if somebody was on the network and they weren't able to communicate outside of their existing subnet, that could certainly be a problem with the default route. We have 7% of you that said a duplex configuration. A duplex configuration is one where one side of the link is set to full duplex. The other side is set to half duplex and you end up getting a problem between both of those and, and, and really working through the, the issue there. It causes a loss of efficiency between those two devices in the duplex configuration. 6% of you chose a certificate issue. A certificate issue would certainly cause a problem if it was a device certificate. The device would not be able to connect to the network. If this is a website certificate or some other application certificate, then you're probably getting an error inside of a browser or inside of an application saying that this is not working properly. But it would not be a case where a certificate problem would end up assigning you an IP address from a different subnet. That's quite a number of jumps to be able to get there. And then lastly, switching loop, 5% of you say the answer is switching loop. Switching loop obviously is one where the switch is configured with a loop. It'll bring down your network in a matter of seconds. It doesn't take long to crash a switch simply by 
taking one interface on the switch and plugging it right back into the same switch. You will crash that switch very quickly. Um, switching loops uh, are a uh, downtime. You have effectively created a denial of service when you create a switching loop. Hopefully, you're running spanning tree so you don't have switching loops or you don't plug in those switches. But in this case, the, the problem we were running into was someone getting the wrong IP address that has nothing to do with a switching loop. The answer here is the one most people chose, which is VLAN assignment. That is the right answer, and that's the one we were hoping to find. Now, as many of you are aware, you can receive continuing education unit credit for watching these videos. Uh, and you can even get that credit. Not You can, of course, get it by watching live, but you can also earn this credit by watching the replay. If you want to earn the credit, you have to receive an email from me certifying that you were here. And to earn that email, you have to follow these instructions. Go to the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website. There's a link there that says Contact Us. Click that link. It will open up a form. Put in your name, your email address. In the subject line, please put December 2023 Network Plus. And in the body of the message on a line by itself, put the super secret code word of the month, VLAN assignment. We went with the, the, the majority there. VLAN assignment is a great super secret code word of the month. Uh, that is the one we will use. You could also put any other message in there you would like after that first line because we've obviously put VLAN assignment on a line by itself. So on any of the other lines, you could even put a message to me because I read through every single one of these, and I do like reading through the comments that you put. But you don't have to. If you just need your certification, go to the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website, click Contact Us, put in your name, your email address. In the subject line, put December 2023 Network Plus, and simply put in the body of the message VLAN assignment, click Submit, and you're done. I'll take it from there. Usually it takes me about a week to turn these around, sometimes a little longer, sometimes a little shorter. Depends on the chaos that is currently enveloping me. But in whenever I get around to these, you'll start to see, you'll, especially if you have more than one submitted, they'll come rolling in pretty quick. And if you need one very quickly, uh, send me another contact from there. Uh, open up another Contact Us link and send me a note saying, hey, I just submitted this, but I need it today because my CEU's I need to collect all of those, and I'll be glad to get it to you a little bit faster. Easy to do for any one of these. Let's do another question, because uh, we have time for another one. So let's step through this one that asks, a company is tracking the utilization of east-west traffic on their network. Which of the following would describe this traffic? Is it contains a known vulnerability traverses the same data center, blocked at the firewall, transfers dynamic routing updates, or uses an encrypted tunnel? Got a few options there. The question again asks, a company is tracking the utilization of east-west traffic on their network. Which of the following would describe this traffic? Is it contains a known vulnerability, traverses the same data center, blocked at the firewall, transfers dynamic routing updates, or uses an encrypted tunnel? If you think you know the answer, use the link on your screen, professormesser.com slash QA to lock in your answer. Please no answers in the chat room. Let's see how you do with this particular question. All these terms that are in Network Plus, as I mentioned, not only are there a lot of acronyms, there's just a lot of technology terms you need to know. And there are quite a few on this list not just in the question, but in the answer. So we need to know what all of these different types of technology challenges are, things that people would run into. Every single one of these is a real thing. They all come from the exam objectives. So you have to piece together which one of these is really what we were hoping to find. A number of you are locking in your answer pretty quick, which leads me to believe that maybe you're just as familiar with this one as you were the last one, which you guys did really, really well on. So we'll have you have a look at these and see if you happen to know these answers. A company is tracking the utilization of east-west traffic on their network. Which of the following would describe this traffic? Contains known vulnerability, traverses the same data center, blocked at the firewall, transfers dynamic routing updates, or uses an encrypted tunnel. How did you do with this one? 
62% of you, not quite as strong as the last one, but still pretty close. Certainly more than half say traverses the same data center. 20% though say it uses an encrypted tunnel. That's east-west traffic. 12% of you so, say that no, no, an east-west traffic transfers dynamic routing updates. And then only 3% say it contains a known vulnerability. And only 1% say blocked at the firewall. So traffic flows and how we describe traffic flows, especially in data centers, is an important consideration, especially when we're trying to describe to someone the way that application traffic flows from one part of the network to another. So we're constantly trying to find easier ways to describe these very complex traffic flows and where they may be going from and going to. One of these terms that we use is called east-west traffic. And this is referring to data that's in the same data center. The east-west traffic never leaves the data center. It may start at a database server. That database server may send information to a web server. The web server talks back to the database server. And it's all happening inside of the same data center. None of those are needing to communicate outside of the data center to another location to be able to complete this application traffic. Now, that is in comparison to north-south traffic, where there is data that is ingressing and egressing your data center. So you're having to go outside of your local facility to be able to complete this traffic flow for this application. This may be traffic flows that are coming from users located anywhere in the world on the internet. Well, that would certainly be north-south traffic coming into our data center. Let's get a better view of this. This is the same data center. And this is describing, it's a very common picture for a data center. In fact, it's, it's not got enough redundancy, quite honestly. There's an internet connection coming in. Sometimes there are multiple internet connections coming in. We've simplified this particular image. And then there is a router, in this case, a router that may have a, a, a significant power to it. It may have a lot of computing power, a lot of routing power instead of, inside of these devices. That's why they're always written to be very large. So these are core routers that are directly connected to the internet. So we have three of those. In this case, we could say for redundancy in our data center. Each one of these routers are connected to switches. And those switches are covering and handling traffic for different types of applications or services on our data center network. One is handling image servers. Another is handling directory services. Another is handling web servers. And another is handling file servers. I mentioned earlier about the web server communicating back and forth. Uh, and then people on the internet communicating into your network. So the people communicating into your network from the internet and down, for instance, to a web server is going north-south. But anytime the web server needs to communicate to an image server, for example, that traffic will be east-west. It doesn't leave the data center. And so we use those terms all the time when we're working through and trying to understand the way traffic flows operate with our applications. And if you're in the working in a network team, you may be thinking, well, what do I care about application traffic flows? Oh, ho, ho. that's all you're going to be dealing with because it's always the network. Didn't you know that? The network is always the problem. You know, part of the issue and the part of the reason that the network is often blamed is nobody knows what's going on on that network. You can't look at the wire and know what's happening inside of it. You can't look at a fiber and somehow interpret the way the traffic may be flowing. It's not like you're looking at the sight glass on an HVAC system. It's not like you're able to pull out a dipstick and understand how much oil is inside of your crankcase. Uh, with networking, you need to have other types of equipment to be able to provide you with that diagnostic information. And very few people have access to that diagnostic information. So if we don't know what it is, that must be the problem. And so very often, the network team is dragged into issues dealing with response time and latency, and everything is slow, and it's the network's fault. So you do have to run into those situations sometimes where it would be helpful if we could describe the traffic flows to those folks in a way that everyone in the room could understand. So northwest traffic, north-south traffic, or east-west traffic are very good ways to understand how the traffic may be flowing so that you can describe some of the diagnostic information that you're dealing with. Um, hopefully, that helps you. It certainly describes why 62% of you chose traverses the same data center as the option, because that is the right answer. 20% of you say uses an encrypted tunnel. 
If we were talking about an IPsec connection, if we were talking about an SSL remote access connection, then perhaps we could say that is an encrypted tunnel. But east-west in itself doesn't describe whether traffic is encrypted or not encrypted. It only describes the flow of traffic within a single data center. 12% of you say transfers dynamic routing updates. And although east-west traffic may include many different types of traffic flows, including dynamic routing updates, the east-west traffic itself is not describing dynamic routing updates. It's merely processing those within a single data center. It's certainly not the best way to describe this traffic. It's not even really a good way to describe this traffic. So I would not count that as being even part of the right answer. Uh, traffic that contains a known vulnerability is uh, traffic that's commonly stopped at an IPS. It's certainly something that we are concerned about. But we would not describe that as, oh, we got some east-west traffic today. That's That doesn't describe a vulnerability. It has nothing to do with vulnerability. And then blocked at the firewall, 1.6% of you said this. Uh, blocked at the firewall, that's a very common disposition. In fact, you really have two things that a firewall can do. It can allow the traffic, or it can block the traffic. Now, there are some nuances in there as well. In some cases, we could modify the traffic with a firewall, something that does happen. Uh, but in this case, when we're talking about east-west traffic, it's not describing a firewall, and it's not describing a disposition of the traffic flow. It is describing how the traffic is traversing within the same building in this particular case. Now, I know we're at the top of the hour. We're four minutes after. But why don't we just squeeze in one more question? What do you think? I think it's a good idea. So we'll see how well you know this particular topic. We're going to start here. And this question asks, a user is communicating to another wireless device over an IBSS connection. Which of the following would best describe this configuration? Would that be non-encrypted traffic, 9,000 byte frames, aggregated links, 160 megahertz channel bandwidth, or no access point? A user is communicating to another wireless device over an IBSS connection. Which of the following would best describe this configuration? Is that non-encrypted traffic, 9,000 byte frames, aggregated links, 160 megahertz channel bandwidth, or no access point? If we think we know the answer, please follow the link on your screen, professormesser.com slash QA, and lock in your answer. Oh, if we could just have a few more acronyms. Wouldn't that be great? Just a, just a couple more to put on the exam? That'd be kind of fun. I don't know. That's what we really are hoping for. The acronyms on the exam are... Uh, are many and varied. Uh, I probably should count them. I, you know, I, I've often said Network Plus probably has more acronyms on it than Security Plus or A Plus. Uh, I think the last Security Plus may have surpassed it, but the the newer Security Plus that just recently came out, uh, we dropped back down again. So I'm wondering. The new Security Plus is only slightly larger than Network Plus now in, in size and scope. So I'm wondering if the acronyms are are very different. I'll have to do a little bit of counting on those coming up in the new year. We'll have to, have to figure these out. A number of you have locked in your answer. No Googling. I see you Googling. Stop Googling. Do not Google IBSS. Don't do that. You don't have Google when you're in the exam room. You don't have Google when you're taking your exam at home. They're watching you. And may, many people don't even realize this. When you're taking your exam at home, you have to have a camera. They're watching you and listening in the entire time. So that's a, a very good example of, of what these might be. Um, I think if you're working through and trying to understand where you go with these questions, it's very useful to know the acronym sometimes. It might help you. In this case, I don't know that the acronym would help you. We'll talk about this in the after show, perhaps, so that we can really break this down. Let's see how you did with this one. The question asks, a user is communicating to another device, another wireless device, over an IBSS connection. An IBIS. An IBIS. It's a bird. That's not what we're talking about. Which of the following would best describe this configuration? Is it non-encrypted traffic, 9,000 byte frames, aggregated links, 160 megahertz channel bandwidth, or no access point? And 41% say the answer is no access point. Then we have a three-way tie for second place between 160 megahertz channel bandwidth, aggregated links, and non-encrypted traffic at around 17 to 18% apiece. And then you have only 4% that chose my favorite answer, 9,000 byte frames. 
which is a real thing as well. So our real question on this one, the thing that really was causing us problem, I think, is what in the world is IBSS? And I think this is where you run into challenges on the Network Plus exam. And I think a lot of people spend a lot of time just memorizing acronyms and what the acronyms stand for. And IBSS, that acronym stands for an independent basic service set. Great. What is that? <laughs> that doesn't help us. So if you spent a lot of time with your flashcards and only studying what those letters stand for, it may not have helped you on this question. Knowing that IBSS stands for independent basic service set is not immediately obvious what this is referring to. So in this case, though, you can see that I added a little context to you. And in fact, you should add the context to your flashcards. IBSS and this idea of an independent basic service set is also the term that we often see associated with an ad hoc connection. An ad hoc connection means that we are communicating between two wireless devices directly to each other. We're not going through an access point. So you're not bringing up a list of all the access points in your area. You're not clicking on that access point. You're not reading through uh, a screen that says, welcome to the network. If you uh, want to use this network, you have to agree to be a nice person. Do you agree? Yes or no? I agree. You now have access to the internet. You don't get that. Uh, with IBSS, you're connecting two devices directly together to each other. There's a little more configurations required when you go through something like that. But it also means that you don't have to worry about where an access point might be. Uh, a really easy way to connect these together. In fact, if you're plugging in these days some of the Internet of Things devices, some of the things you'll notice is that the, the way that you, you bootstrap these devices, the way that you get them initially configured, is you put your phone or your mobile device or your laptop into the ad hoc mode, into that IBSS mode. And you connect directly to that I o IoT device, and it connects and creates that ad hoc connection between the two devices where you can provide it with an initial configuration. A uh, very easy way to do that. So anytime you see independent basic service set or IBSS, we are talking about being able to communicate between two devices on a wireless network with no access point in the middle. And so those of you, the 41.74% of you, I don't know who the 0.74 was, but any of the 41% of you say no access point, you got that one absolutely right. That is the correct answer. Traffic that is not encrypted on the network is, is really just an open network. In the world of wireless networking, it's an open network. Well, that's, that's the term we give it. It really has just no security. A non-insecure or non-secure network, there's no formal name. And IBSS has nothing to do with whether the traffic on that ad hoc network happens to be encrypted or not encrypted. It's simply describing a connection type. Uh, we have 17% uh, that said aggregated links. We've already talked earlier about using uh, lag using a link aggregation. Uh, that, that's one way to aggregate links together. Um, you could also have uh, an aggregated set of interfaces on a single or even multiple devices. Aggregated links is a very common technology to use on today's networks, but has nothing to do with wireless devices using IBSS. 160 megahertz channel bandwidth certainly could be used on an IBSS connection or a connection to an access point or any wireless connection. But the channel bandwidth itself doesn't describe what IBSS is. IBSS is quite simply an ad hoc connection that doesn't really talk about what type of connection it happens to be, only talks about using this wirelessly without an access point. And then lastly, 9,000 byte frames. It's a common configuration option if you were installing jumbo frames, jumbo frames. If it's a jumbo frame, then you were absolutely using uh, uh, you're probably transferring quite a bit of information. I do tons of backups here over my network. I'm always backing up. And whenever I make a video, the first thing I do is make a backup of the video so that I have now all of that information in multiple locations. And uh, I have everything set up to be jumbo frames. It's just an easy way, a very efficient way to transfer large amounts of data across the network. In this case, if we're trying to connect to a wireless device over IBSS, we are indeed not using an access point. It is an ad hoc connection. 
Very easy to do that. Um, and that is what 41% of you chose, and 41% of you got that one. Absolutely correct. Well done. Everything that we talked about today is in the exam objectives. This is an important document. And if you don't have this document, you should, I shouldn't say stop what you're doing right now. Open up a new browser window. Go to professormesser.com slash objectives and click the link to follow that over to the CompTIA website so that you can download your set of exam objectives for the N10008 exam. Uh, it's absolutely free. There's nothing you need to be able to use this. It is something that CompTIA simply gives away. And it tells you everything you need to know for the exam. People ask me all the time, what should I really study for the exam? You should study everything that's in the exam objectives. Now, well, what if I want to study other things? Well, you can do that, but those other things you're studying are not going to be on your exam. The exam objectives tells you everything that's going to be on your exam, or at least everything that could potentially appear on your exam. It's a much better way to describe that. So they tell you. They give you all the information you need to pass this exam. All you have to do is read it and use it as a checklist. And if you do that, trust me, if you know everything in the exam objectives, you're going to pass this exam no problem. That's not going to be an issue for you at all. So make sure you grab these objectives. They are a valuable tool. Make sure that uh, you're familiar with them. And make sure you use them as a checklist. All of my videos, everything that I create in my courses is directly tied back to these objectives. I use this as my baseline, as my blueprint. So make sure you do the same thing. You can find that at professormesser.com slash objectives. Well, of course, we do one of these study groups every month. Uh, we still have another study group to do in December. We're not done with the month quite yet. So if you want to come back on the 20th, that is the same day, Wednesday of next week, uh, here as we're getting into that winding down time for the holidays, it's a great time to come back. And we're going to do Security Plus next week. I haven't even written the questions yet, so I don't even know what it will be. Come on back in a week, and you'll find out along with me what it happens to be. Uh, in January, we have A-plus study groups on the 9th and the 11th that are currently um, scheduled. We have 17th of January is our ne next Network Plus study group. That's coming back, too. And then on the 24th of January is also Security Plus. Now, as I always say, these dates can change at a moment's notice. Sometimes they can be uh, moved around and changed. The times can change. The dates can change. If you really want to know when the next live event is going to be, follow the link on your screen. Go to professormesser.com slash calendar. That is always up to date to the minute. Uh, the moment I know something changes, I change on the calendar first thing. So that is always the best place to go to know if we're going to have a study group that day or not, or if I have to move things around, or if we want to change the way something is doing. You never know what's going to happen. It's a great way to keep track of everything. That's at professormesser.com slash calendar. Well, we've done an hour of Q&A where I've asked you the questions. Now it's time for our after show where you ask me the questions. You can do that right now by going to professormesser.com slash QA and submitting your question. There's a link on your screen where you can put those in for the second hour of our study group, our after show. Don't forget about our Network Plus Success Bundle on the website. You can find it at professormesser.com slash net success. Of course, our vouchers are on our website, and they're already discounted. You don't need a discount code. You don't have to install anything in your browser. You simply visit professormesser.com slash vouchers for the discounts already built in. And of course, you can follow us on social media. Of course, when we're done here, we'll be over on Discord. Go to professormesser.com slash Discord. We've got our YouTube channel, our Twitter, our Instagram, our LinkedIn, our Facebook. Simply type in professormesser.com slash the name of the site you'd like to find me on. A great place to go. Uh, and it's a great way to find out anything else we may be doing here at Messer Studios. Well, that ends our first hour of Q&A. Thanks for joining us for this. Stick around for the after show. I'm going to open up the questions in the chat in just a moment. If you've got to leave, though, we appreciate you stopping by. Thanks for joining us. And we will see you next time on the Network Plus Study Group. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Let's take a sip. Let's put on a camera. Let's move this around. Very good. Things are working. Okay, chat room. Now's the time where you can ask me a question. We have a number of them that have come in. Uh, the way that you would do this 
is you can simply go to professormesser.com slash QA to submit your question. There's a link at the top of the screen where you can go into the tab that has the questions that you can submit. If you don't want to submit your name, that's perfectly fine. You can click a button that says anonymous, and I don't know, I don't know who sent that in. It makes it anonymous not only to everyone else, but also to me. So it's a great way to just ask any question you feel like you want to ask. This can be about technology. It can be about certifications. It can be about uh, what I had for lunch. I don't know. Probably won't answer those questions. Not a lot of people want to know that part of it. But it's a great place to go. Submit your question. Simply visit professormesser.com slash QA. See if you happen to know what that is. We don't put the CEU in the chat room either. You'll have to listen in. Uh, the CEU is worth one hour of a webinar category CEU. So if you're you're wondering what those are, that's where those come from. Let's have a look at the questions that you are submitting and some of the things that you have in this list. Um, before we get to that, the, the important questions are coming out of the chat room. Michael asks, hey, Professor, how's your brother's fudge business going? It is going amazingly uh, it's Uncle Phil's Fudge at UncleFil'sFudge.com. Um, UncleFil'sFudge.com has uh, uh, flavors of fudge you've never seen before. He is always coming up with something very unique. Being based in Florida, he has created not only traditional fudge flavors, but flavors that are very commonly associated with Florida. So if you want a key lime fudge, he's got it. Uh, if you, he has a great fudge. He brought some over for Thanksgiving. Thank you, Uncle Phil. The rock. Uh, he brought in just tons of different ones. Um, the ones I liked, there was a peppermint flavored for the holidays that was amazing. And he very interestingly has created vegan fudge, something you don't often see in fudge. In fact, it's, it's hard to get good vegan desserts, uh, but he has managed to do it. So if you want to have a look at his site, he does amazing stuff over at UncleFilsFudge.com. Be a great gift for the holidays. He's still shipping. He's got them in there. He'll get them from Florida to wherever you happen to be. I know we're getting kind of close to the shipping deadline here. Uh, but another great thing to do, and it and it really is delicious, but it's amazing. It's uh, He does a good job with this. So have a look at that over there. In the meantime, let's look at questions that you has, have submitted. I'm going to start with a question that has come in. Um, this one from Jordan, who asks, Jordan's obviously ready to go. Jordan asks, do you have any suggestions for starting a home lab? A home lab. This is what everyone should have, especially if you're working with networking. You're always going to be running into interesting configurations where you're wondering, I wonder if that would work. What if we move this device to that subnet? What if we change the routing configuration on this device? What if we set up BGP on this? What if we did route redistribution here? What if we move this over? There's lots of things you can do. So you need some way to test and, in some cases, maybe put into production some of these ideas. And a home lab is a great way to do that. Now, from a networking perspective, you may want to ease into this. Some people like to buy equipment. And, and I understand the, the want of having equipment. I understand the, the, uh, there's, there's something visceral about getting that physical device, plugging it in. There's power running through it. You can hear the fan spinning. You can plug in your USB drive and wipe the device and reconfigure it from scratch. Plug in the physical interface adapters and plug in the, the, um, the cables that you're going to be running between those different devices. It's... It's a, it's a lot of fun, and it's also interesting to kind of visually watch where the traffic is flowing. The reality, of course, is when you get into network administration, you might not ever touch a switch. You might not ever physically see a router. They're just already installed in a data center somewhere. This is not unusual, by the way. Um, and when you talk about a data center, especially a data center for a multi-billion dollar corporation, so you're talking about, let's just take a, a, a bank, because these are really good examples of what you would run into. If you work for a bank, the bank's not going to let you, you, you lowly network administrator, walk into the data center for a bank that handles trillions of dollars of transactions. You're not allowed in the room. <laughs> so you can just get used to that already. There are people that work in the data center, and their job is to do the things you need to have done in the data center. They're your eyes, they're your ears, 
they're your hands. And so there's a very formal process. When you need to install equipment in the data center, you have to go through a very formal process of why this equipment is going in, where it will be installed, how, what is the process to install this, and how can we get this device up and running and accessible so that you can take the configuration from there. So there has to be extensive documentation because you're handing this device off to a third party that you may not have even met before. And they're providing the installation services for you, even though you all work for the same company, but you're not allowed in the room. So it sometimes becomes helpful to do uh, a home lab at home so you can have some feel of that. But just keep in mind that in practical use in these types of companies, you may never physically touch the equipment ever. Now, you probably will have a lab so that you can test it in your lab. So you will be touching some equipment, but not the production equipment. You're not allowed near the production equipment. They, they've already heard of me, and they're keeping me away from the production equipment. Um, and so that's, that's a very important consideration. Um, but home labs are great to set up. So if you wanted to get started in something that you could ease into a physical home lab, I think you should maybe start virtually. Uh, one way to really do a virtual lab configuration is to run something like uh, Packet Tracer. That's a, a free product from Cisco. And Packet Tracer is a fun product to use because you can build out a network configuration and a design with routers, switches, in stations, um, and effectively have a simulation of an entire configuration by simply installing and running a simulation software on your computer. It, it is quite remarkable in what you're able to do with it. Uh, let's see if I can get into and maybe continue as a guest into this packet tracer view. Nope, I got to definitely put in an email to be able to run these. So I don't want my packet tracer up. We might be able to do something like this a little later. I just have to find a password. Um, and that's in my, of course, uh, somewhere that I can't get to at the moment. But we will uh, perhaps uh, in a future live stream, that would be fun to do. Packet tracer is fun because on the screen, did I, did I get, get the packet tracer up? There's, there's a number of different um, things you can do inside of there. You can build out a network so easily. In fact, much, much, much faster than physical equipment. Oh, you want to you wanna use a switch? We'll just drag it and drop it on the screen. Oh, you need a router? Drag and drop it on the screen. You need a wireless access point? Done. You need a computer on both sides of this? Put a computer here, put a computer here, and we'll plug them all together. Maybe we'll even set up IPsec between the two. Maybe we'll change the configuration to see what the options would be. Let's set one side for full duplex and one side for half duplex. What type of errors do we see? You know, those are the types of things that can really help you when you're trying to really get a better understanding of how these things would plug in, how you would connect them all together. Another good thing you can do with a lab is actually put it on a live network, even though your network is at home, and then you can connect all of your devices to it and use that as a production system. Uh, a good example of this might be to get a device and instead of using a, a Soho type wireless router or firewall, maybe you use PFSense or one of the many other open source firewalls that are available and you install that firewall on your own device and now you've got much more functionality than you ever had with something that you would get off the shelf at Best Buy. And you can run your own reports, and you can install an IPS, and you can see if the IPS ever fires off. And you can see what you're blocking from the internet. Is someone trying to attack you? How would you ever know unless you had a device that was really specialized that could track these, create reports for you, and give you an idea of just how much information are you filtering from the internet and keeping the inside of your network safe? Can you imagine going to a job uh, interview? You finally send in your resume. They want to talk to you. And they say, well, tell us what you know about firewalls. You should pull, pull open your folder and go, well, let me tell you what I did on my home lab. And you can tell them this whole story I just told you about got open source. We plugged it in. I ran into a problem. Here's the problem we found. I fixed the problem because I discovered this. And I created a series of reports that show how much my systems are getting attacked every day that I'm blocking on this firewall. Here's the report. When can I start? <laughs> That's what you should do. You need a story. And the only way you're going to have a story is if you've done the work. And so I think home labs are incredibly valuable to be able to not just help you learn, 
But now you've got those stories that you could tell somebody that demonstrate to them that you have learned these topics. And unless you've gone through it, you can't speak that way. You can't talk that way. You have no idea the challenges involved in getting one of these devices working. Did I set up the routing properly? Does it have a DHCP server on it? Um, is Was there an issue with uh, the connectivity to my internet service provider? Um, is it able to be updated properly? All of these things are important considerations. And they're things you have to deal with, not just at a very micro level in your home, but those same problems you run into in your house, you also run into in an enterprise. Obviously, the stakes are much larger there. If you do a router upgrade or a firewall upgrade in your enterprise, you can now potentially be affecting thousands or tens of thousands of individuals. And when you do it at home, it's just your house. It's only your family, which I'm not sure which is worse now that I'm thinking about it. But you understand the challenge is that sometimes you need to go a little bit further to be able to get a better understanding. And that's why I think home labs are, are very, very valuable. So a firewall home lab would be a great one. So the one I just mentioned to you, PFSense and put Snort on it for IDS. PFSense is the firewall. Snort is the intrusion detection or intrusion prevention system. Um, and then maybe uh, another good home lab maybe would be to work with uh, Linux devices. Maybe install a SIM on your Linux device. Hey, does, does Splunk still have demos that you could run up to a certain level? That might be a good one to play around with because a lot of large companies and even small companies use some type of SIM. Splunk is the big one in the industry. Everybody knows Splunk. So uh, that would be a great one to install. So get your PFSense running, have it logging all of this data, and then have it transfer those logs using syslog over to your SIM, you're storing the data on a SIM drive. It doesn't have to be terabytes of space, but it could be enough to really keep a, a month or two of data on it or even more. And now you can start running reports from Splunk. So those reports you pull out, you could say, well, I've got PFSense running here, and I just will just loaded up Splunk on a weekend, just something I thought I'd do in my home lab, and here's some reports I created. There, there you go. That's what you want to do is that's where your home lab is. Um, and work through them. Yes, make, always make sure you have the latest version of software. There's There are constant um, software issues and, um, and security vulnerabilities that are always found in all of these devices. Make sure you're familiar with all of those um, and how they kind of affect how you're going to use that product and how you're going to secure it. That's an important one. Um, this question comes up a lot, and I'll tell you why, and I'll tell you why it's not important. So that's, that's kind of a nice way to ease into this. Let me explain why this question was not important. No, the question's important. It's why the question's being asked, which is not important. This is from TB. TB says, are you able to clarify if there are seven or eight steps related to troubleshooting? I don't know. I, I literally do not know how many technical steps there are in the troubleshooting process because, as I have already alluded to, we don't care. The number of steps that you're using to troubleshoot is not the important part. The important part is, what are those steps? What is the process? How do you troubleshoot is the important part. Now, I know why you asked. So you're, and you're, you're screaming to me right now. I'm asking this because this other test I took from somewhere asked me what the sixth step was in the troubleshooting process or something ridiculous like that. Um, and it does. There are, there are practice exams out there that ask you ridiculous things like, what step of the process is number four? What do you do in troubleshooting step number two, number four, number seven? No, nobody cares. Nobody numbers these. Now, I think where this came from uh, is first the exam objectives. Now, I'm, before I bring this up, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a quick little bit of research. Obviously, I don't get to see these questions before they arise. So I'm going to do just a little bit of research here and see if I can find where this problem reared its ugly head. So let me quickly scroll through a couple of things and see if I can quickly find where this is. I don't know if I can quickly do it, but I'm going to try anyway. As you could imagine... 
In the exam objectives, as I mentioned earlier, the objectives tell you everything you need to know to pass this exam. So I think a lot of people that write practice questions, sometimes those folks are not necessarily technical people. I know, hard to believe. It's hard to believe sometimes. It's that sometimes you do run into these scenarios where people who are who are putting together content are people that have maybe never touched a network before. Um, and I, I don't mean that flippantly. Uh, it's just that that's what it seems to be if we look through what they've done. So this is not the case with Network Plus, but it is the case with um, other certifications from CompTIA. So if you were go to go back and look at, I think, the A-plus certification, A-plus certification, not the current version and not the previous version, so you're going back at least six or nine years, there was a version of those exam objectives that numbered the steps of the troubleshooting process. And then most recently, they just got rid of the numbers because, as I mentioned before, that's not important. <laughs> Nobody cares what number it was. They only care what those steps are and what you do to resolve the problem. So what I did for Network Plus is I went to the Network Plus exam objectives, and we're going to pull these up because I spent all this time doing this. So let's first start with the exam objectives for the N10004. <laughs> this is, remember, we're on the 008 now. So three years ago was seven, six years ago was six, nine years ago was five, 12 years ago was four. So 12 years ago, if you were to look at the exam objectives, they say, given a scenario, implement the following network troubleshooting methodology, and here's the methodology. They're not numbered. They're just bullets. Okay, well, that was that was four. So let's go to N10005, same scenario. Notice the bullets are a little bigger. They kind of spelled out things a little more in this one, but still they're not numbered. There's no numbering that you have to know. Uh, how about the N10006 or 7 or which one is this? I don't. This one is the 007. Uh, the 007, network troubleshooting methodology. It's identical to the one you just looked at. The formatting is different, but the information here is identical, and it's not numbered. The N10008, obviously the current version, also very nice formatting. It is not numbered. So don't worry when you run into these questions that you find on there are questions on questionable practice exams. And if a practice exam is asking you for a piece of ridiculous trivia, which ultimately has nothing to do with technology in the world as we know it, then you can disregard that question. And I would argue you could potentially disregard that practice exam. Um, even though you will probably run into a practice exam that says, what is step seven of the troubleshooting process? You should throw it out immediately because it's not important. And as you can tell, we've gone back now four or five different iterations in the Network Plus exam. CompTIA doesn't think it's important either. And they think that because it isn't. So, uh, but I know exactly where you got that from. I, I know exactly where, where you pulled that question from, and you were correct to ask, and I'm glad you did, because now all of us know if we ever run into that, um, you can disregard ridiculous questions like that. If it's not in the exam objectives, throw it out. If somebody, if you're watching something or reading something or looking at a set of questions that talks about topics that are not in the N10008 exam objectives, you can disregard those questions. They will not appear on your exam. They have nothing to do with your exam. Stick to the exam objectives. That's the important part. Okay, let's keep going through this list. Um, so this is, let's do an OSI question. I love OSI questions. Love them. You know, I know it seems like what uh, we've got this question uh, from Fernandez that asks, I understand how each layer of the OSI operates. My question is, does every communication need to pass through each layer of the OSI model? For example, two computers connected to a Wi-Fi and sharing data. Is that a network level communication? Is that application level? Is it physical level? What is what is the connection there? Um, and so that this is an important consideration for OSI. Now, first, let me let me kind of proceed the the answer with um, 
the OSI model is there to give us a broad understanding of network traffic flows. It is not designed to be a granular description of the networking process. And if you find yourself arguing with someone else about where a certain thing fits in the OSI model, you have both may want to consider taking a break because <laughs> it's unnecessary. It's such a broad model that there are plenty of places where both sides of an argument could be correct, quite honestly, because it's a model. It's not a real thing. It's not, an, it's not actual code. It's not actual hardware. It's not an actual protocol. I guess it was, but now it isn't. <laughs> That's another story. Uh, but it's not something you would find in our real world. It's not something that's out here floating around our networks. It's simply a way to describe how traffic gets from one side of the network to the other. And when we talk about whether a device is operating at a particular OSI model, we're really talking about how we focus on or how we approach where this traffic is flowing. And that's why most of the time when we talk about routers, routers make their decisions on how to forward traffic based on a destination IP address. So the router sees traffic coming in, it looks for the destination IP address, and it doesn't have to look any more into the packet. The packet could be carrying web server traffic. It be, could be carrying a database information. It could be carrying um, a, a, an image. It could be carrying a file transfer. But it doesn't care. A router, as soon as it knows the IP address, goes, OK, you don't have to tell me anything else. I got it. I got the IP address. We're sending it out that interface. Bye. And whatever's the payload, whatever's in that packet, router doesn't care. Just sent it on its way. So that's why we mention that although a router is transferring all of this traffic across the network, the router is making its decisions. It's doing its work at layer three of the OSI model. And that's why we refer to a router is a layer three device. So whenever you'd start thinking about where does this device sit in the OSI model, really talking about where does it do its work? Where does it, it operate? That's why switches are at layer two. Routers are at layer three. And traditional old style firewalls are at layer four because that's how firewalls used to work is you just gave it a port number. And if the port number was good, it would allow it. If the port number was blocked, it would block it. That was it. Um, or if you got a next-gen firewall, next-generation firewall, layer 7. It operates at the application layer because it understands how applications operate and can make decisions on whether to allow or disallow traffic based on the way the application is operating, which is unique. So, for instance, you can allow someone to view Facebook but prevent somebody from posting to Facebook. Next-generation firewalls are smart enough to allow that. So that's why, when, for example, in this uh, question from Fernando, it says uh, two computers connected to Wi-Fi and sharing data. Is that a network layer con communication? Well, you're sharing data in some way. That's sharing data. Maybe it's a server message block in Microsoft Windows. You've got a Windows share, and you're dragging and dropping something from one window to another, uh, and it's transferring that data out to a network share across the network. That's layer 7. SMB operates at layer 7. Maybe it's on Wi-Fi still operating at layer seven. Um, so you really do have to look at and describe what you're talking about. The access point is operating at layer two. The application you're using is operating at layer seven. So that's why when we talk about OSI, it's important to have scope. It's important to understand um, and, and understand exactly the device you're describing and what type of data is being transferred through that device. So I think that'd be another great place to go if you're ever in the world of OSI and you're trying to map out what that device does and where it sits in the OSI model, that's the way you do it. You have a look at how it operates and make a decision about what layer of the OSI model does it really care about and what part of the OSI model does it disregard completely. That will help you make that decision and being able to work through those. Uh, but a great question. Thank you for sending that in. Let's get another one from our list. We're good on time. So let's uh, let's do some more questions and being able to step through these. Um, other questions here. Um, so yes, I, I am watching you, for those of you wondering. There was a question that came in, are you watching us? I am. I'm totally watching uh, you and what you're doing. So 
I can't see anything. I don't know anything on here. No one in the television is watching. Nobody in your monitor is looking out at you um, and, and seeing what's there. So, yes, absolutely. Um, so this is one, the question, um, this is actually a pretty good question. It's more of a programming question, uh, but it's from Alan, who says, uh, love to see more questions, more time with you in study groups. This is something you might be able to do. Um, I, I might be able to do that. I don't know that my voice would be able to do that because, as you know, I've, I've been talking for an hour and 43 minutes. Uh, at some point, um, the the voice stops. Um, so uh, the the challenge with time is a good one, and you're you're correct to bring it up. But there are physical limitations along with me just sitting in a chair for a very long time and making that happen. Not that we couldn't make that happen. There could be breaks, and we could I could put up a, a five minute video, and I could walk around, and we could do things like that. We've talked about that here at Mr. Studios. Um, I suspect Alan, and you can tell me in the chat maybe if you're referring to the first part of the study group or the second part of the study group or just both. Do we want more of both? Which is fine too. Um, one of the challenges in this first hour is you may have noticed every month you get a new set of questions. So those don't appear magically. Obviously you have to sit down. Alan says both, I'm talking beginning and the end. So that first hour of questions I have to build every month. I have four live streams. I'd like to add more, but I, I can't uh, just because it's a physics problem of sitting down, coming up with questions about topics that can help you, you know, accurately learn something. You know, I don't want to make the question so easy. We all know the answer. We got a, we had one of those today. So it wasn't maybe not totally everybody knew the answer, but we did pretty well. I like getting questions that maybe half of us know and half of us don't so that we can learn from those. Um, and we can first have people that, okay, I'm learning the right thing. And other people are like, I knew I found something new. I learned something new today and being able to work through those. Uh, but that takes time. It takes about a half a day for me to prep for a single live stream. That's a lot of time. Um, so um, it's one that it's just a, it's just a physical problem. There's problems with sitting this long. There's problem with talking this long. And there's a challenge with simply creating the content that is good enough. I don't want to stretch myself so thin that I'm just throwing out questions like, what number, uh, what is number six of the troubleshooting stuff? <laughs> those are those are not good questions. Nobody wants those questions. So um, I don't currently have plans to extend that out. I kind of half and half it now. We do the first hour and I try to do a good solid hour of questions that are brand new that no one's seen before. And then the second hour is one where I don't necessarily have to prep so much because you're just asking questions of me. And we could do that all day. The second hour is easy. I just don't know how compelling that is. Do, do you really want to watch me more than a couple of hours do this? So that's that's another challenge is after a while, people are like, oh, we could just maybe not talk so much. That would be great. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but that's the that's the idea, um, is that I, I want to keep a good balance between spending a good amount of time on things that we can really use, but then also not overextending ourselves and turning this into something that it really should not be. Also keep in mind, you know, a lot of you that are on the chat are here every week. You're just phenomenal. You're here watching and enjoying and an answering questions and helping in the chat and, an and talking amongst yourselves and thinking about other ideas for when we were talking about, for example, the um, doing things in a home lab. A lot of folks in the chat room talking about home lab and here's what I would do and here's what I would set up. That's the kind of conversation we'd love to have. So that's the idea is uh, is making it that way. These used to be three hours long, if you recall. Back in the day, not so long ago, um, I would have an hour of Q&A where I would ask the questions, and then the after show extended into two hours, sometimes even more. Um, and it's just, it's just a lot there. It's just, uh, there's just a big live stream there, and it's not quite uh, what I was trying to approach. So I think keeping them short kind of helps everybody stay focused, allows me to stay focused, and we get through a good number of questions that way too. So I appreciate the thought. And I love the idea. And if I could figure out a way to make it work in a way that made sense, I do this every day. I love doing this. So it's just more practicality concern. But we might we might continue to tweak the model as we go along. So, you know, stay tuned. 
to what we're working on here. I make changes all the time of different things we're doing. We'll have to see what those changes really, really look like um, and how it works into what we're doing here. But thank you for the question um, because that's a good one uh, from Alan. Um, other questions. Let's, uh, let's keep going through the list of questions uh, on there for all of this. Um, so this is, a, oh, I like this one. So this is, this is probably one of my top five questions I get during, during just normal, normal world, number, normal life. Uh, this is from Oliver, who asks, say, how much are the performance-based questions worth on the Network Plus exam? Aha, good question. This, and finally, I, finally in this forum, I have a way to definitively tell all of you exactly what the performance-based questions are worth. Are we ready? We don't know. We have no idea. CompTIA won't even tell us. They they will never tell us. <laughs> we will never know. We this will be a mystery of life that continues to follow us throughout our years uh, because they will never tell us. They have not told us before. They are not telling us now, and they have no intention of ever describing the grading process for any of their exams. So, um, although we think we know what some of these things might be, it's all speculation. It is all complete speculation. So if anybody ever tells you, well, you know, those performance-based questions are worth so much more than multiple choice, they are. Where, where, why do you think this? Because no one has ever said that. In fact, there is an argument that I will make that say the performance-based questions are either worth the same or maybe even less as certain multiple choice based questions. I'll put that out there because my speculation is just as valid as anyone else's speculation. Now, I will tell you though, there are um there are reports that I absolutely believe the people that came through our chat that I've met online that have been at our website, that have sent me emails, this is more than one person has gone into their exam and they followed my recommendation of skipping over, reading the performance-based questions, but just going skip, 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 skipping through all of them and not answering the performance-based questions at the beginning. So that's the strategy I use. Then I get to the multiple-choice-based questions because let's say you get five performance-based questions right off. Skip, 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 skip. Now we're into multiple-choice-based questions. And go through all the multiple-choice Let's say that it's a full exam and there are 85 multiple choice based questions there. And the reason I skip over the performance based is because as you go through the multiple choice questions, it jogs your memory about the topics that are talked about in previous questions. You've probably seen this just with multiple choice based questions. So by the time you've circled through all of the multiple choice, when you come back to the performance based, oh yeah, I just had a question about that. That reminds me, oh, I can answer this one now, at least with a little bit more knowledge. The problem, though, and what people have done is they've skipped over the performance-based questions, and then they get into the weeds when they get into the multiple choice. And they go through all the multiple choice, and they answer the best they can, and then they get to the end of the multiple choice, and they circle back to the performance-based, and the clock hits zero. Er Exam's over. They never had a chance to answer one of the performance-based questions. Not one of them. Didn't even touch them. And they passed. So we can already say, at least in certain circumstances, that the scoring of the performance-based questions is not so insurmountable that it could cause you to completely fail the exam if you get them all wrong which is a good thing to know, quite honestly. Now, of course, we also believe that every exam is scored differently, that every question is worth a different number of points. So if that's also the case, that may not always be true, that the multiple choice questions are just as valuable as the performance-based. We don't know. Um, so that's one of those where it really is important for you to do as well as you can for all of the questions on the exam 
Never leave a question blank. Always answer something on a question, especially the multiple choice. You should never leave a multiple choice question blank. There should always be an answer. So uh, because they don't take points away, at least we believe they don't take points away. You only earn points if you get it right. Well, that's great because if you guess and it's 25% chance of getting it right, maybe you get those points. I'll take it however I can get it. So the answer to Oliver's question is, mm, don't know. Got no idea how much the performance-based questions are worth. And you're never going to know. So don't worry about it. That's, that's sort of the takeaway I think we should come out, out of this with is don't try to reverse engineer the exam. Don't try to figure out, well, if you score a certain number of questions, you'll pass. Or if you do, doesn't matter. Because ultimately, we have no way of proving it. We have no way of deciding it. And ultimately, it doesn't matter because the score is going to be the score. So do the best you can on the exam. The score will work itself out in the end. That's not something you need to worry about. The score is the least of your worries. It is. The, the exam topics, the exam objectives themselves, that's your worry. And that's why I say focus your effort on that. If you're spinning wheels and you're spending time and you're studying, that's what you should be studying don't start studying how they grade the exam. It's pointless because we'll never know. So I think that was that was worth talking about. So thank you for that question. Um, other There was a question in the chat room, um, which I think is worth mentioning. Will I be posting an updated Security Plus playlist soon? Nope. I, I don't have any plan to. I've already created the latest Security Plus playlist for the SY0701. It's already out there on, on YouTube, and it's done. So um, the, the good part of this, this answer is that I'm not posting an updated playlist because it's already posted. The latest Security Plus exam is already out there, and you can watch every bit of it. It's 121 videos um, uh, over, I think, 14 hours. So there's tons of content there for Security Plus. The 701's out there, and you can watch the whole thing right now. You are good. Um, the whole playlist is ready to go. The only thing I haven't done with it yet is I have not, um, I've not done the transcription. So some many of you noticed that on the YouTube video courses for the training courses that the transcriptions are remarkably accurate, and that's because they're not done by a machine, because <laughs> machines aren't very good at really anything. Um, and so if you want to have the most accurate, you know, they're not perfect, but the most accurate transcriptions are done by a human being who's watching the video. So that's what I do. I get human beings who are trans professional transcriptionists to watch the video so that they can spell a lot of these things right. And then they go through and they, uh, they put in the transcription. They do an English language transcription of every training video. So that takes time. So once I get them out on the internet and people are able to watch them and they can verify and do a little bit of QA for me and tell me, nope, everything looks fine with that one, I send it over to the transcriptionists. They do the closed captioning. They send me that content. And then I'm able to, uh, to get that up and running. So it takes another couple of weeks. Uh, but once it's done, it's done. In the meantime, the auto transcribing that YouTube does is okay. And it gets through that two week period. But I like to have a live human being transcriptionist. I have people in my family that are hearing impaired. So it's a very sensitive topic for me. I want this to be accessible by everybody, or at least as many as I can can functionally do. So I want them to be I want the audio to be clear because maybe someone can't see the screen. I want uh, the transcripts and the closed captions to be accurate because maybe they can't hear what I'm saying. So those are important considerations. It's also useful for people that may not have any type of, of challenges because maybe, you're, maybe your primary language is not English, but having a good transcription and having audio that's clear can really help with understanding what someone may be saying in a different language. Um, so that's that's another good reason to have that there. So that's that's my recommendation. 
Um, but a but a good uh, question along the line. So yeah, if you want the newest, you want to, the SY0601 is the Security Plus that we've been using for the last three years. It will continue to be available through July 31st of 2024. So you got another six months before that one even goes away. More than six, seven months before that one disappears. They're giving a huge ramp to that one. So you can still, if you've been studying for the 601, keep studying. You'll pass it and be done before it ever retires. So that's available on my website and on my YouTube channel. And then if you want to take the new version that just came out, although there are limited books available, there's still my video courses available. My course notes are available. My practice exams will be released on that over the coming months. Um, those will be available. So if you want the newer version, newer doesn't necessarily mean better. It just means it's newer. Um, in this case, it's very different. There are two very different exams. You know, pick the one you're going to take, study from those materials, and take that exam. Do not study from the 601 and go in and take the 701. It, it will crush you. Um, the 601 exam objectives rip 65% of those objectives out, and that's what made it into the 701. More than half the exam gone. That's what they changed. That's, that's how much they changed. Then the 701 exam, half of that exam is brand new content that's not in the 601. That's how dramatic that change was between the 601 and 701. And that's why I tell people all the time, do not study from one set of, of product of training materials and go take a different version of the exam. That will not be your high percentage pass. For sure. That'll be the lowest percentage pass. Don't put yourself in that situation. So absolutely think about that. Uh, another question. This is from Alberto who asks, uh, what should an information technology cover letter include? Uh, this is one that I address in another video, but I'll talk to it. If you look at the YouTube video description of this video, I have a video. In fact, I think it's in this video description, but if it's not, Lori, tell me and make sure we get this in there. I have two videos on resume writing. Uh, one is five reasons your resume keeps getting rejected. And the follow-up to that one is five more reasons your resume keeps getting rejected. So 10 reasons total. One of those reasons is you're not putting a cover letter on it. And I think a lot of people tend to dismiss cover letters. They tend to treat cover letters as something nobody looks at, and they don't put in much of an effort in. In fact, they have the same cover letter going to every single job posting. Worst thing you can do. Because if somebody is allowing you to put a cover letter on, there's an opportunity there for you to promote yourself. Getting a job is as much about your technical abilities as it is your marketing abilities. You have to be smarter on how to get your resume in front of people and have them like it. And if it's just a generic cover letter, this is, thank you for the opportunity to allow me to submit this resume for your job posting. I look forward to hearing from you and your team as to a possibility of joining in the near future. Many regards, Professor Messer. Worst thing you can do. That is the worst cover letter you could think of doing. What I would recommend is to use a different style of cover letter that actually speaks to the job. And I think every cover letter should be customized. I'm not talking about spending an hour customizing this letter. I'm talking about 15 minutes of doing this. And the style that I recommend, especially for technology cover letters, is called a T style. T is in timeout. So like T, that T. Uh, and it's a cover letter style that on the left side, you put down what the hiring manager says is important about this particular job. Oh, you must be able to understand Palo Alto Network's firewalls. You need a, uh, a knowledge in routing and switching. You need to, you know, they have a list of requirements. And on this T format, you put maybe your opening paragraph is, Thanks for allowing uh, me to submit my resume. I believe that the set of skills I bring fit your job description perfectly, and here's how. P point, point one, I want some, they, they want somebody who understands Palo Alto Network's firewalls. 
on the right side, you put, I currently hold the Palo Alto Network's uh, PCNSC certification and have been working with their technologies for 10 years. Second bullet, you know, and you just keep going through those bullets. So you're taking what they say is important about this job and you're explaining why you're a much better fit for this job than anybody else who you'll ever see. And that brings your resume a different perspective. Now, certainly there are people who are going through these job postings and they're not even looking at the cover letter. But I will tell you, HR people are not those folks. HR people are reading these cover letters. They want to know first, how well of a communicator are you? And when you communicate this information, how does it apply to this job that you are applying to? So if you can position yourself as being better, not just in technology, not just in grammar and spelling, but you're also providing a summary, an executive summary of, you could read the rest of the resume, but here's the important part. Here's the part you care about. You want this? I got this. Let's make a deal. That's it. Those are the things you should go. So a T, T style is what you should do. That is what information should be in your technology cover letter. And I'm speaking specifically as a former hiring manager for systems engineers. So I looked at a lot of resumes and I read every single one of those cover letters and I make a note if the cover letter is just generic, they put nothing into it, I take that to heart. Uh, oh, you're not going to put anything into it? Must not be that important to you. There is a good part of that. You have to prove yourself. And I, I mentioned there's another video if I can just... I know I keep mentioning my videos, and I do that just because that's where I put the answers to these questions. Uh, there's another video in that list in the YouTube video description of this video of how to get a job in IT with no experience. It's a 30-minute video. And if you know anything about my videos, I don't waste time. So it's 30 minutes of just chock full of information. It's just just packed, tight, full of details. And one of the things I mention in there, especially in the job hunt, is it's important to be technical. It's important to have certifications. It's important to have some skills. It's also important to know somebody who already works there. So uh, it's, it's one of those non-technical things that people don't often talk about, but we trust people we know. And if we're working somewhere, people we work with trust people we know. So it's always good to network. It's always good to people network, not just PC network, not just computer network. We're talking people networking. That's another important part of this. Um, so get a good cover letter. Know some people that work there. Get a good home lab. Get your stories ready and go get those certifications and your formal education and you'll get that job. That's what you do. That's the strategy. And you can do a lot of other things around that, but that's the strategy uh, to really focus on these. I often think, what would, what would happen if we use strategies for submitting a resume that were similar to the strategies that sales teams use to get people's attention. And you may have seen this if you've ever worked in a technology job. I used to work on the sales side. I was a systems engineer. I was a pre-sales systems engineer. So technically, I wasn't the one doing pricing. I was the one understanding how the product would work understanding what the customer's challenges were, and then coming up with a configuration that would meet their challenge and fix their problems. And one of the things that we would always talk about is we have this amazing product. If we could only show it to someone, they would fall in love with it immediately. And so how do you get in front of someone? The first step is getting in front of them and saying, have you even considered this amazing technology that we have that nobody's ever seen before that works better than anything in the industry? I'd love to show this to you. But how do you even get in the door? How does anybody even pick up the phone? You get so many phone calls in of people bo bothering you. Hi, I'm calling from X Corporation and we're wondering, would you like to get a blue check mark? This is the problem is it's constant phone calls, constant emails. Um, and so that's the real key. The idea of this and being able to kind of break it down into its basic form is what if we could do some of these skills? One of the things that, uh, that salespeople would often do is sometimes they promise something. This, is not, this doesn't work everywhere. Sometimes they, uh, they send a remote control in a FedEx package and they say, we'd love to talk with you about our new technology and how it can turn your network security into a turnkey remote controlled solution. I don't know. I'm just coming up with stuff. 
but we just send the remote control. And if you allow us to come in and spend an hour of your time, we'll bring the Roku that goes with it. We'll bring the Apple TV that goes with this remote. And then you can have both of them. Many companies don't allow third parties to give them gifts. And so that doesn't work with everybody. So uh, it's a very good example, though, of how you can you can get people's attention with uh, with technology, with with fun, flashy things. But the thing that I thought would be interesting, what if you FedExed or sent, you know, in, an, in a separate envelope that directly to HR instead of submitting it on a website? What if you submitted it on the website, but then you also sent it to them with a FedEx package? Now, obviously, it costs, you know, 10, 15 bucks to send this over. But even if it's two day on FedEx, what is it like less than $10 really in many, many places, especially if it's a local position. So they get this envelope, they have to tear open the envelope and they pull out your cover letter and, and your resume, which has obviously been printed on some fine linen paper. Um, it has been proofread. It is perfect spelling and perfect grammar. You've really spent time on it. The, the T style cover letter speaks directly to the job. You know, maybe that's another way you get in front of them. You know, those are the things that I think are, are really, really useful um, and working through them. So I, th that's just another example of how we might be able to steal strategies from other parts of the world, other people doing other things. How do you get in front of people? How do you get their attention? Um, I, I, I mentioned in the video of how to get a job in IT with no experience going to user group meetings, meeting the people at your local Microsoft user group meeting, Cisco user group meeting. Those, those two alone would be tremendous to meet people. And you go to a two or three of those, and you're really connecting with local people in the area. And you can ask them, oh, you work over at company XYZ. I've seen that building when I drive by. You must have a huge network. What's that like? And then finally gets her all, that's amazing. You guys hiring? Can I give you my resume? You know, if ever, something ever pops up, you've got it in the queue. Just give me a ring. You know, those, that's what we do with those meetings. For those of you wondering, yes, we talk technology, but we also network. And that's a big part of the industry. You start to know people in the industry and you know where everyone's going. You look out for each other. You hear about a job one place. You go, I know a guy who'd be good for that. Let me call that person. I know somebody who'd be good for that. Let me give her a ring and see if that'd be something she'd be interested in. You know, that We do that all the time. That's what LinkedIn's for. Well, if you don't have a LinkedIn already, go get your LinkedIn together. People have gotten jobs just from LinkedIn. So the, it's another one of those things that I think people speak negatively towards social media, but LinkedIn can be a very powerful professional sales and selling yourself and technology job uh, function for you, along with keeping track of people you meet in the industry. Um, I do have a LinkedIn that's my personal LinkedIn, and a number of you, you're so nice, you send in a, an invite and you've noticed that I have not approved the invite. Because the only people on my personal LinkedIn are people that I have personally worked with. And so that keeps my network one that is very well, uh, well vetted. It's perfect for understanding what's going on with the people that I know that I work with directly. But we do have our, our LinkedIn page for Professor Messer. So you could always join that too uh, and work through those uh, different things. Um, I know we're past the top of the hour. I want to do one more on here of other things. Um, some of you have asked about uh, in the chat, and there were a couple that came through in the study group questions about um, about uh, sending donations. And I, I don't take donations. I, I try not to take donations. Um, the only thing that I think is, is even enabled right now, and I really should disable it, there, there's a super thanks on the videos that someone could submit a thank you to the video and include uh, a donation with that. And I'm, I'm just not, that's not my business model. It's not something I want to rely on and it's not something I want to expect people to do. So I don't, I probably am going to turn off right after this, as a matter of fact. Now that I've talked it through with you, I'm glad we've had this conversation. I think I'm going to turn that off too. I just don't think that's that's how I would like to, uh, to have this business run. Um, I think you getting a product that's valuable, that can help you earn these certifications, that's a high 
the highest possible quality that it can be. That's where we focus our efforts. And I want you to be willing to buy those tools and those products to be able to support what we do here. But I'll also tell you, just watching the videos supports us. The videos are ad-based. Um, they are part of YouTube, so they don't overwhelm you with advertisements. They are well measured out, and I get to tweak that along with the folks that I work with at YouTube. So we try to make it so that it's not in your face, but it does help pay the bills. And that's a great way to support what we do. Just watch the courses. Makes it that easy. And that way you don't have to worry about donations or anything else. It, it Don't worry. There's no guilt involved here. If you watch the videos, I'm super happy. Thank you for watching them. Um, and that's that's the least uh, of uh, that that uh, we have to worry about there. If there's other things you want to add on to that, like course notes and practice exams and uh, other uh, su success bundles and other things, vouchers we have on our site, that helps too. Um, but I don't I don't want to expect or even be in the mode of constantly. Hey, have you bought the 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 the, the add-on, or do we have the piece on the website? Do the click the button? Do we have donation? No, we're not going to do that. Uh, just not not my thing. Not my thing on here to be able to work through that. But I, I will tell you, I do appreciate the thought um, of nothing else. So, um, so nice of you to ask, but it's just not something we do. I just feel don't, don't like it, so I'm not going to do it. And by the way, everything else is working out fine. Website's running great. People are supporting the site. Uh, people are getting certified, so we're good. So thank you for watching the videos. Let's do some more here. Uh, I'm going to get another one in uh, before working through here. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, this one, this one made this one hurt me. I had to laugh. Uh, this is from ML it says, "Hey, do you ever plan on working for a corporation again, or just planning to continue the study groups?" <laughs> well, that's a uh, that's a fine question. Um, as as you're, most of you are probably aware, um, I do work for a corporation called Messer Studios, and it is a full-time plus corporation. Uh, we do a lot of work here. We're constantly creating content. We're even building out more content over the next year. There's more things we're going to bring to the table. We got more work here than we know what to do. So there's plenty going on. I would like to say my plans, uh, if we change this question, do I ever plan on working for a different, another, a third-party corporation ever again? No, I don't. I don't plan on doing that. Um, I like doing this. And I'm going to keep doing this until you're just so sick and tired of me that I have no choice but to go back and work for the man again. So that's, that's but I, I can tell you immediately, I would try to go back and get my last job at Palo Alto Networks. I loved that job. The, my systems engineering job working for them was fantastic. Uh, so much fun, and the technology is remarkable, and you work with such smart people, and uh, it was just a fantastic place to work. Um, but um, I like doing this, and I like the I like running a business along with the technology part of it. So I like that part of it, and I'm I'm going to keep doing this. This is working out okay. We're going to keep going down this road. Um, and so I like, we'll just keep doing the study groups. I'll keep creating content. I will cre keep creating study materials. We'll figure out ways that we can get you a job or get you a better job, even better. We're going to keep doing this and keep going down the road of making that happen. Um, it, maybe someday there'll be a need for me to step into the corporate world again, working for a third party. Um, and that's fine too. We'll figure out what comes after that. But Right now, everything's going pretty good. I'm going to find some wood to knock on. Everything's great. We're going to keep doing this because this is fun too. And I'm going to keep keep these things rolling out. We've got so much more happening or just over the next 12 months that we have planned. Uh, you know, I see a lot of people in our industry that do similar things that I do that are independent, primarily CompTIA-related trainers and some of them have recently sold their company and they no longer are in charge of creating these materials. Some of them have retired recently. And, and uh, from a security perspective, we've had just in the past year, we've, we've lost uh, a couple of authors. So we've lost some people who've been doing this for a long time. They've passed away. So I, I take that pretty seriously. Um, you know, life is short. And I like the idea of building something that later on I can look back on and say, we created 
a quality product that people were able to use that was accessible to people all over the world that changed the way that people were able to get a job or get a better job. That's our goal. That's our our business mission you know, that we have. Our mission statement is get a job or get a better job. It could not be simpler than that. So I think as we as we approach the the next 12 months, the next year, two years, three years, next five years down the line, we're just going to keep doing this. Next 10 years. And there, there's so much to do. Uh, I have so many things on my list that there is no possible way that I would ever be able to get through all of them, which someone once told me is the, the sign of a, the, a proper entrepreneurial mind. Uh, and in our case, it's more about getting people those jobs. So I think that's a good combo. That's a good one, too. And we're going to keep that one-two punch. I think that's the good way to do it. And if uh, something changes in the meantime, keep me in mind. I'll have to update my resume and get my uh, cover letter done in a T format. Make sure you customize it for every single job you apply to. Well, I think that brings us to the end of our Network Plus study group for the week. We got another one of these planned next week. Come on back on Wednesday of next week where we have our Security Plus study group. Those are always fun. Those are always very, very busy. And I've got a whole new set of questions I haven't even written yet. So who knows what that one's going to be. It'll be something interesting nonetheless. There's always some fun going on. Uh, if we don't see you on that study group, that will be our last study group of the calendar year. We're now in the holiday season. Um, this is a great time of year to just enjoy yourself, your family, your friends, connect with people you haven't seen in a long time, and think about what you'd like to do over the next 12 months. This may be the time when you start changing your strategy about what might be the best place for me in IT. And it's always a good time to kind of sit back and think about what your plans are. And whatever it is, hopefully we'll be able to join you for that next year of whatever comes up. Thanks for joining us. We love doing these study groups. We uh, appreciate your time and hope to see you again in the new year. Thanks for being here. See you next time on the Network Plus Study Group.